Seeing the presence of a quorum, we'll call and order this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Uh, it is currently being, it is not being broadcast live, but it is being taped uh, for rebroadcast, which we appreciate deeply from Amherst Media. The first item of business is approval of the minutes of September 27, 2018. I don't know if the committee has had an opportunity to look at um, those minutes or not. I move to approve the minutes of September 27, 2018. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any changes, alterations, additions? Seeing none, I'll entertain a vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes, September 27th, uh, please uh, raise your hand signifying aye. Carries um, seven out of seven present. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm abstaining. I wasn't present. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought your hands were up. I apologize. <laughs> um, then it is 601 and passes. You're going like this? It's like a breath of sigh of relief. We got the minutes done. Uh, now, announcements and public comments. Um, are there any announcements from the committee? Mr. Dunley. Um, Amherst Education Foundation is uh, holding its annual trivia be the 25th. Annual Trivia B, next Thursday the 27th, I believe it is. Um, done this in the past. It's a hoot, holler, and good time. And it raises money for our schools and raises general awareness, good community thing. Uh, they're still looking for teams. So if uh, anybody out there listening or watching wants to throw their hat in the ring, it's, uh, it's, it's free and it's for a good cause. So. Cool. Serena. Are the trivia questions of the 1960s? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're all over the map. Some of them are Amherst centric occasionally, though, uh, or you know what I mean, local centric. So, knowing your horse caves and Daniel Shays might help or something. Um, yes. And just I think this is what you said, but I want to. I'm not sure. So it's October 25th is the date of the. Oh. I got so it is, the tw is it the 27th? 24th. One then. Ah, uh, 24th one. To make it more confusing. One. Okay. <laughs> on the 25th. The 24th annual will be on the 25th. Okay. Oh. Yeah. My mistake. Well, that's quite right. different. Well, no worries. I just want to make sure that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm apologize. I'll tighten this up now. I'm realizing I'm starting to free associate in this picture. Uh, any further announcements from the committee? Seeing none. Uh, if there are public comments, uh, please uh, come forward to the microphone. You'll have three minutes to spin the clock up. Um, oh, I can get it up. Can you get it? Why not? Is that all right? Yeah. It goes easier. You know, everyone can see what the three minutes are and stuff like that. And uh, so you have three minutes, and of course, identify yourself to the committee. Um, should have gotten my phone out. Um, I appreciate your patience. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's it's up. It's up. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, hi, I'm Deb Leonard. I'm a parent of uh, a fifth grader at Fort River and two students at the high school. And um, I was at Fort River for much of the day today. We were uh, doing picture day, which is always a fun activity with lots of happy faces, a couple sad ones. Um, yet, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to see things in action. And um, one of the challenges today in Sequad was an overall smell of mold. So out slightly outside the hallway, but in the quads, four classes, first and second grade, five, five teachers, four classes, 64 students smelled <clears throat> mold all day long. So I was in and out over the course of the day. I spent maybe 15 minutes in there and I started to get a headache. And the teachers reported um, itchy eyes, headaches. So this is a part of the building that doesn't have um, the leaky ceilings, which is interesting. So the speculation is that it's the HVAC system. Um, so I'm here to say, and we all know these buildings have problems, but really emphasize the need to get a uh, fast track to getting um, students in healthy buildings. Uh, we really need to do this in a way that's not gonna take to 2035 to do one building at a time. The, the twin building 
model is going to be the only thing that's viable. So that's what I'm here to remind you of, encourage you to think about working through. I think there's some degree of um, misinformation out there amongst the public. They, they seem to think that the Fort River Building Committee is kind of going to solve all these problems. <laughs> and um, how that fits in with the MSBA proposal and those pieces are really not well understood in the public. So this, this idea that there's this magical committee that's going to solve the problems is, is really out there and I think we need to do what we can to pr present clear information about it. Thank you. Uh, are there additional comments from the, from the public? Seeing none, we'll close public comment period. Uh, the next uh, item of business is subcommittee updates. Um, I know we have on our agenda a subcommittee review, um, so we could defer a conversation of membership and issues around when we're doing different committee subcommittees until um, that item. Uh, which is 6E on the agenda. Uh, if, if there are no updates from the different committees, then we'll proceed with our agenda, which would be unfortunate because it'd be for our dear superintendent who's on the other side of the room right now. Um, you know, we do. Actually, we do have one thing to talk about. I just to mention, sorry. So, the mass, oh. so uh, Anastasia Ardonia is, is the delegate to the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. And uh, she can't, turns out through work requirements, she's not able to attend this year, which means we have an open slot for an MASC delegate. Um, so if there's anybody from the uh, committee who's interested in going, um, if you haven't gone before, it's, who's, has anyone gone from the committee right now to the conference? I've gone. Um, so there are lots of interesting workshops that you can go to. There is actually, as you're called a delegate, there actually is typically on the agenda <coughs> some resolutions or other items that are adopted by the MASC that as a delegate you'd be then authorized to vote on behalf of the committee. Um, and you're typically, by the way, voting without direction. So you're probably going to have to go there and use your best judgment about what the committee would want you to do. Uh, and uh, uh, and it's, it's paid for. The registration is paid for. You can also uh, have the hotel, I think, reimbursed. Yes. Um, Reimbursed. I know she had already reserved a hotel, so it may be possible. So maybe transferable. transferable. Uh, and the <coughs> dates of this are November 8th and 9th? Um, so technically the conference runs from the 7th to the 10th, but I think to your point, the, the meaty parts of it are the 8th and the 9th, absolutely. Okay. Okay, so 8th and 9th. Um, so you don't have to answer this second, um, but just if you're interested or if you want further information, you can certainly contact me. You can contact Anastasia. She's been before. You can contact the MESC, go on their agenda, the website for their agenda. But it is it is available, and so it'd be great if somebody took advantage of the opportunity. And yes. if we didn't mention it before, it's in Hyannis. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. It's always in Hyannis. Um, so it's uh, <coughs> that's where it is. <laughs> um, Worcester's closer. Um, so that's it for super subcommittee updates. Uh, on to superintendent. Yep, and I think I'll be relatively brief. So this is a follow-up on an item that was discussed at the last regional school committee meeting. Um, one typo, it should say the districts, um, because all three um, districts, I know there's a regional meeting, but I think it's, it's relevant. All three districts um, are working together to receive quotes from qualified firms that specialize in facility of accessibility. Uh, so we did that quote process, and the low quote uh, came from a firm that has done some work actually locally, both in Leverett, but also in Newton, which is not super local, but um, positive references, positive um, information they sent us. So we're still finishing that process of the references and contracting, uh, but we believe that we'll be able to have the work complete and presented in January. So as the capital project um, process is, is in full swing, to have that information available um, at us, and it's been a nice, it's been nice, that, that cost, the key, ver the key reason I said districts is that cost is across the three districts, and that's not mm -hmm. a region-only cost, and we feel like we can cover that from facilities revolving funds that won't hit the fully appropriated budget. 
Um, last week, on Friday and Saturday, there was a team that attended the Massachusetts Farm to School Institute at Hancock Shaker Village in, uh, out in the Berkshires. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm for this team. <coughs> Sasha Palmer was sort of our lead on it, the food service director, and you heard from her at the last meeting as well. And so there's a lot of energy excitement. The group's getting together this week to the com come back to me next week to start identifying how they might implement what they learned and what a plan might look like. Um, so I'll know more the next time we meet, but um, they expressed that it was helpful to work with, was, I think, eight or nine other districts uh, geographically across the, straight, uh, across the state who are present. Uh, each of them have a coach um, who are working with them on how to implement more farm to school, um, getting in front of our students and faculty. Um, we'll hear about Summit Academy later, so I think I'll, I'll skip that one and, and let Mr. Slovin talk through it. And for those of you who are on the school committee, a couple of years ago, we partnered with uh, an organization called the Pear Project, which is based out of Boston. Um, it's, I think, Political Asylum, Asylum and Immigration, and I forget what the R stands for, I apologize. And they're basically a group of attorneys. They recognize that there's, right now, a dearth of attorneys. The supply-demand curve is way off for the need of immigrants, um, and then the amount of immigration attorneys who uh, can support those folks. So they train attorneys who are not specialists in immigration to come and do presentations. From from our perspective, that's great because we're not encouraging clientele or, you know, there's no business relationship that can be formed. But I was present last uh, couple years ago, about a year and a half ago, as was Mr. Jackson, uh, actually in the space where we had about 40 students uh, have a presentation, be able to ask questions of folks about knowing the immigration rights, and that's evolved and evolving. So we're going to do that, right, students graduate, they change, and we're going to do that again. The additional piece that we're able to do this year is they're willing to come back the following week for individual one-on-one -on -one sessions for students, if students want, to identify, you know, a particular situation and get specific advice based on whatever it is the students share. That, all that's confidential and anonymous. We don't know who's... Uh, going to be participating, uh, but it, we're going to offer it to students, and it was highly res uh, appreciated last year, or year and a half ago by students, and we anticipate that doing again, but it's one of these things that you feel good doing it once, and then you realize that the world changes and the, the faces who might attend change, and we're trying to make sure that we're keeping up with those changes, uh, both locally and nationally. So, that's Great. it. Any other questions from the committee? The superintendent? Any of the items put up? We're at risk, by the way, of having a very quick meeting, uh, which is going to be problematic because we have presentations that are scheduled and people who aren't here to do the presentations right now. So um, uh, the, that's the chair's report. The chair's report is. It out of um, there's a uh, trying to keep the tone light, by the way. I'm having a struggle doing that. He's going to you know, feed me here. Um, but the uh, so I think what we need to do because uh, we're on the new and continuing business is I think we should reorganize the um, agenda to catch up to 715. Uh, and so my initial thought on that is to, do you have any suggestions? I'd, you do. Yeah, I was thinking subcommittees review might be one to put up since it's sort it's of on exactly the- exactly the one I was gonna pick. Very cool. That's so awesome. Uh, okay, so I, we do, do we still have in our packets the list of the subcommittees? And Second to last page. Okay, great. Yeah, it's a bit of an eye chart. Um, so I guess one question I have is, um, which of these committees have actually been meeting that we know of? Now we know obviously our, our CPAC representative has been going to CPAC meetings, which is great. The SCTF has been meeting, so the SCTF representative is going to that, as well as also um, the collaborative representative. So there's some of them that are, we you know, are, some of them aren't meeting, like the Regional Assessment Working Group hasn't met. Our contracting <coughs> stuff is obviously off at the moment. We haven't scheduled any auditing or audit or budget meetings yet. Those should be coming up actually soon. Yeah. We have met. We have met. Budget subcommittee. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. It's okay. And we were, I attended the 5 o'clock <coughs> meeting today that was canceled. Rescheduled. Rescheduled. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry to hear that. At least I'm happy to met them. Yes. I met the last meeting. Yes. Yeah. 
Wait, there wasn't a meeting today, though. It had been no. Rescheduled. Okay, sorry, you made me nervous that I missed the meeting. <laughs> okay. No, my, it's funny, actually. My confusion is I was on that committee for two years, and so in my mind, uh, like I, I thought I had heard it was happening, and then nothing came of it later. <laughs> and of course, because I'm not on it anymore. I guess we should have added enough. No, no, no. well, yeah, that would have been a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that would have been, that would be. Well, that's actually what that slot is for on uh, subcommittee updates. It's just that if you've met, talk about what you've talked about so that the rest of the committee can be aware. I mean, it's not to save me from my complete ignorance, <laughs> although it had that side benefit too. Um, okay, so, but audit hasn't met? Okay, so that, that should be coming up though sometime in the relatively near future. Um, data trends hasn't met. Uh, and is that is it contemplated that they would meet in relationship to the strategic planning process and data involved in that? It could be. Um, it's been a number of years since that group has met, but that would make logical sense. That suggestion would make logical sense. Yeah. To me. yeah. Okay. Um, SCT again. Po what about policy subcommittee? We've had. We need to meet. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The problem with the policy subcommittee is there's no chair to call a meeting. Okay. So who's on who's on the committee again? <coughs> okay. Um, anyone want to be chair? I don't think it makes sense for me to be right now. Okay. Well, I wasn't trying to put people on the spot negatively, like you have to declare your unwillingness to do so. Or not unwillingness, I just mean your lack of interest in, or, you know, whatever the point is. <laughs> just... If nobody else is volunteering, I'll be chair. Okay. <laughs> I mean, because I, I think the deal is, uh, officially, I think the chair, the, the chair of the committee actually officially assigns the members of the committees. I think also means I can designate a chair. So I'm going to designate you the chair. Okay. So now you can call a meeting. With Deb to organize a meeting. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Great. That sounds cool. But we're good to go. See, this is a productive portion of our meeting. We're getting stuff done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, recreation working group? I've been retired. <laughs> the group's been Did, retired or yep. you've been retired? I've, I've been, and the group has been also. Okay. Uh, regional assessment working group is really not an entity right now. So we're going to keep that taken care of. Um, superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee. Yeah. No, we've also not met. Okay. We probably want to get an updated <coughs> calendar for the year, I think, right? You know what I mean? Like looking at it this year, mm -hmm. some sort of draft calendar of activities to be able to present to the whole school committee and discuss publicly. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. A related issue. When is our next meeting? Uh, I don't actually know. Luckily, we have a team. We have a team of people. Crack, crack team. I'll just take my phone. It's easier. Over this way. <laughs> We're going to say November. November 20? <laughs> it might it be. November it 20? might actually be it's in November. The, it's the 20th, I believe. Of? Of November. Okay. Yeah. November 20th. Thank you. It's quite a while from now. Uh, so actually, it'd be great if the Superintendent Evaluation Committee, Subcommittee met between now and then so that we could have in front of us and also explain to the public a clear sort of calendar of, of when we're going to, for example, <coughs> do the media review, when we're going to go through evaluations and things like that. Um, and then I think the last ones, so again, if somebody ends up wanting to be a delegate to the MSCA, MASC uh, conference, you can let Deb know or let me know or something. Um, and the other ones, we're still looking for an Amherst Media Liaison, who's a volunteer for that. Oh, is this, so th are there, this no, agenda, I, think, yes, please. I thought the Amherst Media was just the Amherst. Oh, have we resolved that yet? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with Mr. Sullivan. I think I agree with him, too. Yeah. So we resolved that? Yeah. Okay. Then we can take this off that list, this list. Um, they were looking for a long time for us to, to designate someone, weren't they? Yeah, I think... I mean, right or wrong, I'm just saying I think they were pestering us to get someone on. The, the Amherst Media? Yeah. Yeah, I think the Amherst rep has 
in the past has sort of served both districts because in this in that particular situation, some situations it doesn't make sense. I think that yeah. one it, it tends to. Okay. Yeah. So were there other items that people want to discuss relative to subcommittees or other? Yes. So just a collaborative representative from mm -hmm. region. Just because I work for multiple districts, I, I tend to get confused, so I apologize. But who is, it's not listed here, but oh. who is a collaborative rep? Maybe we don't have a collaborative rep for the region. Yeah, and I'll be there Friday, and they, they typically like to have all their districts represented. Yeah, no, 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 that makes sense. I mean, I was, it's funny, actually. Am I wrong that Anastasia is the rep, representative of the Amherst Committee, then? That's what she, I, I mean, the reason I was confused yeah. is I know she's talked about right. the collaborative and I think talked up the quality of their dinners and the... <laughs> Good information you can learn from me. She was trying to sell. Now I'm remembering. She was selling it yes. to try to get one of us to join. And I believe that's go. correct. So again, we'll take volunteers for that too, if anyone's interested. Um, and if you're not at the moment, then you can. What time is the meeting? Uh, there Wednesday nights. Miss Cassinson may know because are you the Pelham rep, Miss Cassinson? Oh, a long time ago. Sorry. A couple years ago. I but yeah, I think they were Wednesday evenings, and they alternate okay. between Northampton and Greenfield. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, I know there was interest in having this item on the agenda. So obviously I've sort of hogged the microphone walking through all the committees and when they're meeting and what we're up to and stuff like that. Are there other issues people want to bring up relative to subcommittees? And obviously, at some point, if we want to have, I'm looking at you because at some point we want to have an advocacy subcommittee, we'd have to think actually formally, like formally create one as opposed to have it as a sort of an ad hoc thing where people are working on deliverables for the committee's consideration. Yeah, yeah so, I, so that was my thought as well. Um, I don't know. It's, it's um, yeah, so advocacy, depending on what the topic is, mm -hmm. can be extremely time consuming. <laughs> and so, if we're simply looking to formalize what consumes our time offline, it makes sense. I don't know, though, how much more effective or productive it would make the advocacy to formalize it into a committee. I don't, um, it's typically, uh, at least in my past experience the last couple of years, um, uh, when something comes up, it's, it's, a, it's two people that are mostly coordinating yeah. on different things, in different people, um, but you know, so there's never a quorum issue, and, and, it's, and it's usually, um, it's not deliberative in the, in the sense that the committee's sort of already expressed a position, whether it's on foundation budget advocacy or charter school expansions or, um, or whatnot. So, yeah, I, I, I can't, at, at the moment, I, I can't see a compelling reason to make it a committee, but right. open to it. Certainly this year is an interesting one to consider, given the uh, higher than average level of advocacy that um, the MTA and MEJA, M -E -J -A, Mass Ed Justice Alliance, biggest progressive uh, educational advocacy group in the state, um, has been talking up, you know, putting real pressure on the foundation budget uh, as well as a number of other educational issues. So. Right. I tend to agree with your first point. <laughs> no, especially because also the committee has to be engaged as a whole. It's not, I mean, it isn't something where a subcommittee is going to go off and just do a bunch of stuff. It's actually good, I think, that the locus of decision-making and discussion remains here with this group. But then there's stuff that needs to get done between the meetings, and that stuff always stuff always comes back to the committee, which I think is useful for us. I think it's good. Um, all right, I'll, I will move on from this item then. And we're still 15 minutes ahead of time. <laughs> this is just like an unheard of thing. Um, so it's almost embarrassing. Uh, do you have a suggestion of a next thing to go to? Superintendent um, Goals. Huh? Superintendent Goals? We could go to Superintendent Goals if you like. Do you want to go? Sure. All right. So it's on the very back page of the packet. Oh, the only thing I'd say, though, about this is that during the SETF discussion, we're going to have a discussion about Superintendent Goals. Yeah. So I don't really, the sequencing feels wrong yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Backseas. We take that back. How about charter, charter school, school expansion letter discussion? Hmm. Okay. By agreement, we'll move to that. Are we done with the discussion? <laughs> Peter, Um So I don't know right. if this is going to fit the bill of um, expanding into your 15 minutes here because it's a pretty short update. 
Um, pretty much the, the big process update is that the new deadline for input to the State Education Commissioner, Jeff Riley, who is the first person in the process to either approve or not <coughs> the expansion of the uh, charter school in Hadley, uh, has been moved up. The, so the deadline for input is now December 3rd. It was November 1st. Okay. So any members of the public uh, and our committee can send emails or letters to him. It's, I've memorized it at this point, charter schools at DOE dot mass dot edu. Um, I would strongly encourage any member of the public to send however they feel about this topic. Um, but um, that is the reason why I don't have a draft letter for us okay. to review and discuss um, since we have a little bit of time to uh, to uh, engage on that. So Cool. Yes, Ms. Reno. Is there any way we can find out what criteria the Commission will actually <laughs> use to make their decision? Gentlemen? So that is an excellent question. I wish I had a great answer for you. I think every person who advocates against charter school expansion would love to know that. Um, it's, it's, uh, and that's, that's a lot of what goes into how we want to craft our letter and, and, and what we want to say. Um, it's pretty much trying to read into the mind and decision making of Jeff Riley, who's a new education commissioner, and, and what um, criteria he'll use to evaluate. There are sort of um, some standard published um, aspects from the last couple of commissioners where they talk about um, financial stability, academic performance, um, serving a population that's representative of the region, um, and, and other things. Um, but it's, it really comes down to kind of a human decision. You know, one, for example, one thing that we talk about a lot here is the financial impact and how uh, since the formula uh, for charter school tuition is net school spending divided by number of students, and a school is an economy of scale, it's extremely unfair <laughs> to a uh, public school when one student goes to a charter school. The formula is broken by almost every person's account, even those who publicly support charter schools. Um, however, the Department of Education doesn't have any jurisdiction over that. And so we've talked about, we sort of do want to make that argument to an extent, but not maybe use all of our letter real estate making that argument, because um, pounding that drum too loudly could potentially upset. Um, and then it's really reading into what is also going to be influential on the Board of Education. So the Board is appointed. Um, it's, um, I would say, shifted ideologically, um, depending on your perspective and evaluation of the members. Um, given the number of years, our current governor, who's very pro charter school, uh, has been making the appointments. And um, it's, it's hard to know what will influence that Board, whether it's simply a matter of making a dispassioned, reason-based argument. Uh, using their DESI zone data, or whether um, additional political pressure needs to be applied either by school committees or the public. So it's a very difficult question. It's, it's probably the root question of all advocacy on this issue. I'm glad you asked it, even though I don't, don't have an answer. Separate from the school committee, um, I've now drafted like an initial draft of my letter on this topic, and when I finish it, which I would hope is in the next week or two, I'll, I'll be sure to share it with the, the committee as well. Great. So uh, I don't see any reason we can't accept gifts before the end of the meeting. Yeah. And we don't have to wait till the end. So if anyone has, yes? I think the next, uh, my understanding is the people who are here to present on SETM presentation. Yeah. Are, I, uh, is my watch really way, is my clock, is that clock way off? Oh, no, that's right. No, it's right, I'm just. Okay, it's 7.04, the item is for 7.15. Oh, yeah. To me, 11 minutes early is really early. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm just wanting to knock off. I mean, Absolutely. I almost had it done. It's like it's so easy and quick to get the gifts done. I will. And then look how good we're going to feel when we look at our agenda. We've knocked off so many items. Yeah. It's like a feel-good moment. Anyone want to read? Make a motion. I move to. Ex I'll recognize Ms. McDonald. I move to accept the gift from Alexandra Rizzo Cerboni, number 2606, to support Arms Music Department in memory of Ryan Moriarty in the amount of $50. Is there a second? All second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the gift that is read, please signify by raising your hand. Carries in hands. The gift is accepted, and thank you very much. Um, <coughs> And now it's 7.05, so I think um, we might want to move forward and see if we're able to. Are you um, ready? You're good? Okay. Awesome. Um, 
Because you never know, right? Sometimes other people are waiting to come in and they're going to be late. Um, how, I mean, and Anastasia's not here. Uh, do you, are you on the committee? I am. Do you want I'm, to introduce this on it? I'd, I'd be happy to. I wasn't, um, I wasn't able to move. Um, attend some of the earlier meetings when a lot of the drafting of this of this document was uh -huh. the work was on, um, but the, the group has put together um, a letter that um, I think summarizes very nicely the the goals that um, the group would like to see, um, and we have two folks here who are willing to present. So. We had asked, is it possible at all to do a little bit more of a circle so that it's oh, a little bit of a discussion rather than. Um, if you if you wish, um, you could do two things. I mean, one, one, you could. Yeah, the answer is yes. By the way, but I mean, you could either sit where you are. But then the question is, can we get on microphone or? Move the microphone up. Because well, yeah, why don't you? Even if it's behind us. Okay. And well, you can. Yeah, you can. Okay. Like, you know. Do you have any idea if they're winning? Uh-huh. But I'm not going to spoil that part. You're not going to share this. People who DVR it. <laughs> Celtics opening night, too. It's a big night. So thank you for taking this early. <laughs> okay. Let's start. Yes. So, um, School Equity Task Force was formed over five years ago. And, um, it involves a large body of town people who help think about these, creating these, these six points. And the, the people involved ranged from tenured professors at local universities to former administrators and teachers who have worked in this district for decades, community activists, parents, guardians, and grandparents, of current students and alumni. So that's the range. Um, these six steps involved a lot of work over these years. And it involved initiatives, policies, programs, and directives. And that's how we came to this. This document is an effort to build a comprehensive approach to confront and name inequities in this school based on facts and data collected. But how that's done is very, very important. And that's why this is here, so that then we have data to then compare so that we can see the real results of what's happening in the school. So does anyone have any questions? Or? Are we on We're gonna item? Get, we'll get into each point to provide you a bit of a clearer overview, but essentially, this is, as Elisa said, a, a accumulation of like five years plus worth of work based on prior work that's been done by the School Equity Task Force. Um, so we now see it as appropriate of kind of putting it into evaluation criteria to use to evaluate the superintendent to see, and it, it is very data focused so that you can measure, okay, here's where our baseline was, here's where we are now, was the objective met? Right. So the first point is um, eliminate racial disparities in discipline of students at both the middle school and the high school. I, just, I apologize. I just want to yeah. I apologize for two seconds because Mr. Menino raised a point that I wanted to make sure the committee was. Well, aware this of. was the question. Since this is, oh, well, I was gonna. I thought you were getting at something else. Since this is a presentation, and oh. unlike public comment, where we have to sit here stone faced and say nothing and whether we want to say something or not yeah this oh, excuse me this is the opposite of that where it's an opportunity where we're going to hear information but at whatever point either you think's appropriate or someone has a burning question hopefully we'll be able to get into more of an interactive discussion around what we're learning today from the sctf representatives and then also just to follow up if there's any clarifying ongoing please really important to understand this in order for you to evaluate the superintendent. This right. is very, very important. Right. 
Just ask, I don't think you um, introduced yourself, and I think for my benefit and the benefit of yes. those at home, it would be really helpful. My name is Elisa Melnick. Um, I'm a resident of Amherst. My son graduated, went through K through 12, graduated, wow, I think two years ago. Yes. And I'm Katie Lazdowski. I'm also an Amherst resident and parent of a first grade. Great. Please continue, but I just wanted to yes. realize we hadn't talked about that. We hadn't done introductions, nor talked about yeah. the sort of the ground rules of what we're actually doing. So, Mr. Nino, I have a question about 1A. Yes. Is this a big problem, a large problem? How do we know whether the problem exists at all? Can, can well, we, um, sorry. Yeah. You were going to be introducing each item and discussing yes. it first? Yes. Oh, I thought Let's do it in that order. I'm sorry. Okay. Also help people watching at home eventually. So... <clears throat> and maybe just before I say that, there, there is a national fact of a problem in this nation, in this whole nation. There is a, there's a problem with disparity. So, um, and this town is not e exclusive to that. Um, so number one, eliminate racial disparity in discipline of students at both the middle school and the high school. And A is um, the goal is to get the facts, get the data, and then reduce what they are by 25%. So once we collect the data, then it's to reduce it next year by 25%. That's A. And to clarify again, five years SETF has been working to obtain that data. We have yet to see the district's collection of the data. We've seen know whatever Desi has, but in terms of collecting and seeing the actual data for the regional district, we are still waiting for that. So point B is really honed in on trying I was to get in hand. Yes. I understood the problem. You don't right. know if there's a problem until you measure it. Yeah. Yes. So, you you know, you're right. You're right. I just, um, I'm coming from an assumption. Absolutely. And then just what's important about collecting that data is you, you categorize it by grade, race, ethnicity, income, and gender so that you can just start making comparisons. And that's, that's data, you know? That's, that's data that the way you collect it and organize it on a computer. So that's kind of, um, and that, then that, that it gets publicly reported before the superintendent evaluation. And that, um, oh, the number D is providing the data and you collect it anonymously by who report, um, when discipline is reported so that no teacher is targeted, but that the administration knows if it's a small core of teachers who are doing this. this. So that's very important so that it's not publicly known, but the administration knows about it. So it's, um, yeah, so that's one. Anybody need, you know, questions, a clarification? So, yes, sir. She raised her, uh, uh, here, there, yes, sir. Oh, sure. So I agree with this goal, it sounds like, I know nationally this is an issue and it's something I'm definitely concerned about. Um, I am also somebody who's worked a lot in um, data collection and evaluation, and so I have some kind of nitty-gritty questions about this because, um, number one, I think it's interesting to take one year as a benchmark because as we all, or anybody who's done data analysis knows you, how do we know that this year is going to be a typical year? Maybe we're going to do really well this year and then well, mask that there's a bigger problem that's been going on previously. Or maybe we'll do really, really poorly, and achieving this 25% is going to be easy. So I, I understand, and I'm sorry because I'm, you guys have been talking about this for five years, and I've been thinking about this for a couple of days since I got the, the agenda. So I guess that's my first concern. Like obvious, and I, I see that here, but I think it really it's a strong preference to get a few years worth of data so we can know are we is this year typical? Because otherwise I think you're setting, if, if, if you're going to tie it to a goal that you have to be down by 25%, you want to know whether or not this year is, is yeah, exactly. 
Um, my other concern is just, you know, I work in um, with health data right now, and I have all sorts of protections about making sure that, like, I can't report things in certain ways by race and gender because you'd unmask the identity of a patient, potentially. So I'm concerned about our students, especially protecting their... I get the anonymity of the teachers, but I'm actually more concerned about the anonymity, I hope I'm saying that right, of the students. So how are we going to make sure, if we're making this data publicly available, that we're not identifying, like, if I'm the only, not the only, but kids know who gets, if we're talking about suspension, you know, oh, Joe got suspended, and he's African-American male and also low income, and he's showing up in this rubric. You know, I'm just so... And that's another really big concern, and I'm sure there are legal implications that the superintendent can think about more specifically. So um, I think it ha it's great to have this be data-driven, but how do we do it in a way that sets the right goal and also protects the identities of the students that we really want to protect? And that's the whole reason we're doing this. So. I can address some of that. So as you'll see, we're hoping for longitudinal data, if it's available. Um, the idea is when we first asked a number of years ago that this was being collected, we do have to start somewhere though, mm -hmm. right? And I think I think your concern is very valid, you know, and it won't we won't know the trends until we have a number of years under our belt collecting. But I think it's important that we do start somewhere to see, you know, what what is going on. Um, the other aspect that you bring about is certainly a concern. Um, and I think certainly working within, you know, legal constraints of protecting anonymity and such is um, certainly to be acknowledged and, and respected, but at the same time, I think, um, I think there's a, perhaps a bigger concern in addressing the climate in the district that we need to really take a look at the groups of students and the trends that we see among who is getting, you know, disciplined so that we can make, you know, our professional development um, tailored to what those trends are to try to eliminate any discrepancies that are noted. Yeah, um, so just on, on 1A, um, I guess two questions so I understand it better. Um, so reduced disparities by 25%. Do you mean the disparity percent by 25%? So let's say, for example, the disparity is 4%. Do you mean going down to 3% or reducing it from 75? You know, is, it, is it a quarter of the gap or is you, it? You know, there's more clarity on the appendix. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. Oh, so yeah, so that's just that question. Yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, so I guess, it, um, someone mentioned this before, but it, I guess what discipline is, I, I guess, is kind of key to this data, because there's suspensions, but then discipline comes in many different forms, right? And so Absolutely. to what level do we want to capture that, and how do we categorize that? And then I start to think, well, we don't want to lose the discipline that is not suspension, and yet in order for the data to be meaningful and longitudinal over time, to have a data set that's large enough to interpret, and, and, and also carry meaning, you need it to be recorded consistently, mm -hmm. right? And so you have teachers of different grades, different classes, different schools, um, and, 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 just, and I just don't know, uh, because I'm not a teacher, as to whether that's, um, what the challenges are, I guess, in, in saying like, oh, well, I, you know, um, uh, metered out this form of discipline, you know, how is that then categorized? And so, um, yeah, I guess it's more of a question. Right. <laughs> Knowing our limitations as a school equity task force, we weren't too prescriptive in this, so it can be highly interpreted. But you know, in, in thinking about just the resources that are available and you know online devices that could be used to track discipline, where a teacher goes in and says, "Okay, today I did this," or you know, had this action directed towards this person for doing this, you know, and just some sort of organized, systematic way of collecting that. That data, if it's not already. And yeah, because the school, each school most probably, and depending on the grade and depending on the principal, um, collects this. It's very important to collect this. So whether it's a child sits in a, you know, 
in a corner, out in the hall, doesn't get, doesn't is not allowed um, in recess or lunch or art class. You know, it, it could take a lot, a lot of different forms depending upon. And I think that's a very important discussion because um, that's how pervasive uh, it it can be, and exclusion and um, alienation. So I think it's actually a really important conversation and consciousness raising to have, actually. So. so yeah. I've been reading the newspaper for oh, 40 years, and this issue has come up over and over again. So I assumed this data was already being collected. Is it being collected now in some form? So um, it is. Um, and, and to the point about it being on the DESI website, that comes from us. DESI doesn't, they're not Big Brother. They don't know who gets suspended or how many students or what their identities are. That's data that we supply them. You know, when we're talking, Ms. Cunningham and I were talking about this, um, I think the challenge for us is the collecting the non-suspension data, and it kind of gets to what Mr. Demling was saying, gets a little more nuanced. Uh, most, what we think of punishment, actually doesn't get doled out by teachers. It's the deans and the principals who are more involved in that. So it's a little harder to distinguish for us. And the current system we use for that collects data that also involves things that have no consequences. So when a student does something that's concerning, the consequence may be a communication home to let the family know and see what's going on. And that's not a, in our terms, that wouldn't be a consequence. That's around communication. So we were talking about how do we pull out things that are more, that suspensions are easy, right? So that one is really clean. But when we're talking about non-suspendable offenses, um, how do we do that? And what's the difference between a student saying, you know what, you know, I need, a, I need a break from X versus a teacher. And that line seems really clear when I'm talking about it. When you're in a classroom with adolescents, that line is not as clear. Um, and I think that's the part of this that, as we talked about it, we have to do some thinking, some work, and maybe come back next month of what might make sense. Um, because right now, that's a little different than how our models are, are currently focused. They're not focused as much on so the consequence end of things, because we've really shifted our protocols and our dynamics where we don't view that as um, we're, we're, we are much more proactive than we were. So, like, you know, going and seeing a restorative practices uh, professional, that's not a consequence for us. That's an intervention, a proactive intervention. And, and so I think that's what makes part B of this. Perhaps we need to go back and, and think a little more deeply about what that might look like, because um, that's not necessarily data that's collected cleanly at the current time. We're, we're, we're collecting a lot of data to be proactive, not necessarily on the consequence. So there's, I mean, so there, there's, there is an awful lot of discussion around the question of um, disparate treatment of of students, right. actually, really of everyone. Yeah. Um, but I mean, but in this case, in this context, we're talking about students. Um, there have there have to be best practices that are out there that are being adapted by school districts, um, and different dimensions of this challenge, right? So I mean, clearly, adopting restorative justice as a practice is in fact it's 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 adjacent but it's actually an important adjacency to this in terms of looking at disputes and how behaviors are going to arise and how you can best you know socially adjust deal and being proactive on those on those issues same thing with professional development around racial other issues that are on there too the better you do that the more likely it is you're going to be able to create an environment in which staff uh, all the professional staff are thinking more consciously about how they're engaging with their colleagues as well as students and families. But there, but I am assuming there has to be some kind of a practice that's also directly involved in understanding, looking at data to understand if there is in fact some kind of culture or practice that is differential or disparate in its impacts and then sort of directly engaging. Yeah. And I, I mean, that would probably be easy to think of doing in a, and forgive me for saying this, I don't mean this in a provocative way, but it would be really easy to do in an environment where you already know there's some really wickedly outlandishly racist behavior going on. It's probably harder to do or more subtle to do in an environment in which it, it feels like a lot of people are trying already. So, but my, I mean, the reason, I'm, I'm sorry that's long-winded of me, but the reason I'm, I'm saying it is only because 
to the extent people feel there is disparate treatment, that's a problem. Getting data to under, understand where they can document whether there's disparate treatment and impacts is important to do. I agree with that. As, as you recall, over the summer, um, Anastasia Ardunas and myself were having a conversation with you um, in February about that right. very topic because we thought we wanted to get a better handle on understanding mm -hmm. what the data says and we talked about how hard it is to get the data but the importance of doing it. It's something we talked about as putting as a priority. Um, but uh, And then the next step to that would then be saying if that were, regardless of what the case is, how do you hone in on improving practice and improving outcomes, mm -hmm. right? And we can't be the first district to do this. Oh. And so I guess what I, what I would, I mean, and this is, not, this is not a statement on whether one would embrace these specific goals. To me, what it is saying is that it would be, it would be interesting to hear the best thinking that, you would, that your team would have, someone can collectively at you, including out in the audience, about what, what should we be adopting mm -hmm. if the general concept is, A, we'd like to know if we have a problem and be able to explain it transparently to the public. B, we would like to know that we either are or are adopting best practices in this approach and that obviously that should, res that should result in some meaningful, observable, favorable impact over time, right? Meaning a reduction in disparate impact. I mean, that makes sense to me. It does. I mean, I think I was going to respond to that, or we were going to respond to it, I should say, um, a little later we're going to talk about training and professional development, you know, which goes along with what I yeah. heard you saying. Um, it's about well, it's identify the best practices, and identifying it's one thing, and how do you implement it is... And, and forgive me, I'll, I'll stop yeah. there, but forgive me, I'm also realizing for a matter of time, yeah. that was literally just item one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, unless somebody has something else they want to bring up, I want to stop and allow you guys to mm -hmm. continue. Folks to continue. And I think that was just the intent we want is to formalize that data collection, right? And to formalize a definition of what constitutes, you know, discipline actions, disciplinary actions. Um, so number two, increase the percentage of people of color in each category of school district employees annually until it uh, appro approximately equals the percentage of students of color. So research is shown in our appendix has intentionally been research light we can supplement that if desired, because um, again, as Elisa said, a bunch of us do this work. So if you want resources, but research has shown that um, it's important that students learn from educators who reflect their racial identity. Um, and as I think as a district, as we see an increasing number of students of color, we need to hire and retain um, teachers and administers, uh, administrators of color as well. Um, so again, this, this also goes to getting measurable objectives where we need to be collecting um, or, ha or obtain the data to show the district trends, examining why educators, and specifically educators of color, are um, perhaps leaving the district and at what rates in comparison to um, white educators or administrators. Happy to answer any questions about that. Any questions on this? I, and again, I know this is in the works and being discussed, but we're hoping to make it a formal evaluation evaluation criteria. Yeah, <laughs> extreme from one to two, right? Um, number three is fully fund the restorative justice program and participatory action research program. Um, when SCTF first proposed two years ago the restorative justice program. It was two full-time people. It included a YPAR program, which was training of youth who get paid over the summer in this skill of participatory action research. And it never was intended to be chopped up. And it got chopped up. And in order to really, in, in the same way retaining administrators and teachers of color in a district that has primarily white teachers of color and, and administrators, especially when a shift has to happen, the district institutionally must be very intentional and supportive in a lot of ways, not just by hiring. So for restorative justice and YPART program to be successful, it has to be supported. 
and it has to have two full-time people. It has to have a wide PAR program that the students get trained in because then they get the tools to express. Um, it, it's just so many things that, uh, that I can't, but, um, and that's the essential, that, that is the true way that could be deep-rooted deep success not just flipping, oh, okay, it worked this year, and phew, we did it. And this, this goes back to point number one, right, where we're trying to alter or introduce a new means of disciplinary action, if you will, by way of this restorative justice program, um, which has, in the past year, has been off to a great start, but, um, you know, we see meeting frequently with the director of the restorative justice program, we see the need for more funding, right? So much so that she's reached out to ask us to do some grant writing and um, which we can only commit so much time to, as you can understand. But um, supporting that financially, I think will again address a lot of the different issues that are systemically connected. I just have a question with the idea of stipends for student leaders. Is that something we do for other student leaders in the related, like other roles that students take on in the district? I'm sure there are tons of paid intern programs in the school. Mark would probably know that. Is, is, are there other programs in the high school, for instance, where students get trained for a few weeks in the summer and get paid? You don't know. You don't. And I think part of the intent there also is to use the resources that are, uh, Holyoke, for example, has a restorative justice program through their Palante program, mm -hmm. right? And to tap into those student experts and to bring them to do like a trainer of trainers, if you will. Oh. Okay. There's ideas ar around that, using that as part of the stipends. But then also, I guess, making this... If you think about it, a lot of people might be limited to participate in such a program because they are busy after school, you know, working a job or whatnot. We don't want that to deter people from participating in this. That, I think, was the rationale behind it, because it's not just in school hours, perhaps. Sorry. The purpose of this presentation is what? To come to a vote on these things or just to have them aired and discussed? Uh, currently aired and discussed. I mean, we're not, in a, we're not, there's no vote. Because I have questions about percentages and things like that, so, but. Uh, well, I'd say, t I'd say, t I'd say two things to that. I mean, one, the challenge we have is that we, we're time limited in terms of the discussion. So I think if there were, if there were additional questions that you were looking to get answered beyond sort of what we've already been doing, um, I'd hope you could give them to the SETF, maybe through Because my the chair major question on all these things is, how much will it cost? Well, that's sort of an easy question, easier. I thought you were going to ask a tougher question than that. You probably already have a budget. No, do we already, so you already presented a budget previously. We have, yeah. yeah and the initial budget was upwards of 150000 mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a certain percentage had been granted, mm -hmm. Sixteen thousand of which had been granted but then reabsorbed in the budget. So any, any, at any rate, weren't we going to have uh, this fall uh, DW on the regional agenda? We, we have that scheduled, I believe it was December. Okay, which is, which is hel just helpful because I think what, the, what I learned at some point in the past few months, whenever that was, um, was that I think it would be helpful for the committee, particularly when we're talking about restorative justice and restorative justice practices, to not have kind of a um, abstract talky understanding of what that is, but actually have more of an integrative one, which I think um, meeting her and having, I don't know how we we're going to organize it, but perhaps even a sort of an unusual way of organizing the conversation um, Dr. Morse, you have anything to say with that? No. Okay. I mean, I think you've captured what we had originally talked about. Oh, good for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
So um, unless there's anything else in this, please continue to the next one. Sure. Point number four is broaden and deepen the learning of faculty, staff, and administration about race and racism with special emphasis on systemic racism and unconscious bias. We've heard presentations that you and know that you guys are all working on this. Um, and again, without being prescriptive, we just want to emphasize this idea of ongoing learning um, and not the kind of one and done models, but using perhaps low cost, effective professional development um, strategies such as, you know, peer learning groups, ongoing reflection, re reflection on practice, or, you know, even equity oriented observation tools um, for teachers to be, you know, observing each other or observing their own practice. Um, the idea here creating a shift um, in how we think about and talk about systemic racism. Um, and then also point C, just to highlight, is to develop a plan for educators to have ongoing training about how to have the difficult conversations about systemic racism and unconscious bias with students. Um, this is a challenging topic for a lot of people, but to offer professional development and ongoing practice with each other as educators is incredibly important if we want teachers, and I hope we do, want teachers to um, kind of capitalize on school, local, and national examples of inequity and use these as teachable moments for students, right? Because we want, I would hope, our students to leave middle school, high school with a sense of racial literacy where they can talk about race, right? So that takes practice, believe us. <laughs> Number five, increase the enrollment and success of students of color and low-income white students in honors and AP classes in the high school. Um, so again, the, the data to show what percentage now of students of color and low-income whites who are in honors or AP. And then once we see those facts, assuming, um, develop the initial steps for an action plan to shift that. And a final evaluation criteria that we propose is to broaden and deepen the learning of students about race, class, and other equity issues. Um, and I might, um, <clears throat> it, it speaks in general terms, but it's important, I think, that we think about the capacities of our, of our students um, and perhaps target those students who might need more practice in this than others. And again, research shows that it's oftentimes white students, white people, who need to explore white privilege, white fragility. Um, so perhaps tailoring our, our classes or, or trainings towards those topics in particular. Great, other questions? Uh, questions? So I, I think another challenge that I don't think should prevent data collection, but it's just something to like that will be part of the mix once we start reporting on this data is that when you when you start to break down data um, by more than uh, two or three variables, the data sets get really small, and so it becomes you know like like you're talking about um, like race within um, AP class within department, right? It's going to get you know, a, a handful, if, if that, um, or, or single digits, depending on what you're talking about. Uh, and then when you start looking at trends, you, see, you can see, you know, really wide jumps. Um, so I'm, not, you know, I, I'm talking about um, just data sets in general. And so um, I don't think that should, that should prevent us from reporting on data, but it becomes a communication issue because you could, you could have one year where it looks like you had, you know, double the number of students of color in a particular department's AP course but that's a difference from one to two or from two to four, and it doesn't really represent a meaningful trend. And so I think as, as much as reporting the data vigorously is, is important, it's communicating as well in, in an ongoing fashion. That's not just, because even, even if every single piece of data that SCTF has ever asked for is produced tomorrow, that's, that's the beginning, right? It's not the, it's not the end. It's, it's, okay, how do we interpret it? How is it changing over time? What's the, it's, it's a means to an end, right? It's like, um, I think, I think it's really important to call out specific numbers to have goals. Um, and yet, um, 
and yet the, the data and the trends are, are all f are helping us to facilitate improvement. So um, it's just it's a big challenge. I, I happen to work with data in a similar sense, and we run into this problem all the time, where we want we really want to know what the trend is, but it's it's hard with with noisy small data sets. <coughs> Earlier this year, we had a presentation describing various courses, history, literature, social sciences that address these issues. But the call is for at least one course devoted primarily to one of these issues. Is there even one course in the curriculum now that is devoted primarily to these issues? So overall, I do want to say that these goals are valuable. And to answer your question, I know that we did have someone come in, the assistant principal at the high school came in and reported on them. And what I would like to say is that I'd like to invite her back to respond to this. Um, and um, another thing I wanted to mention is that you, know, um, you talked about intentional planning for all of this, right? And I do recall when I did have the presentations that we were doing a lot of these things already yet we were um, asked to make it more public and report it more often. So things such as, um, if you look at goal number four, where it talks about broadening and deepening the learning of the faculty and staff, we are doing that. Um, the, the administrators also have a UROC on doing racism training on November 8th and 9th. And we aren't looking at this to be a one and done. There are things that will be followed up afterwards. Uh, and we're looking to try to have one of our curriculum days or half of a curriculum day be something where the district-wide professional development continually takes place. So um, when you look at your last goal under that column where it talks about the plan for the ongoing training, about having those difficult conversations, that is part of the professional development that we are doing. We do have Dr. Stephanie Logan from Springfield College coming in to perform that or have that workshop for our staff. Um, there's, there's so much here that we are doing that, you know, in the November presentation that HR is going to have, some of it will be addressed, but once again, it's something that um, we do have to let the public know that we are actually doing these things. And I think to just address your question again about the particular course, it's, it's not that just the course is offered, but that it becomes kind of a, a requirement for graduation. Right. So, um, I mean, just to pick out one of them, by the way, because I've been... Superintendent Morris knows this. I've been talking about the desirability of understanding and getting data so that we're um, not operating in an environment of, even if the anecdotes are meaningful for any individual, but we're not we're not planning on that basis. But we're actually looking at. That's why to me the discipline information and figuring out what that is is important because it, it frames a conversation around what would it mean to be optimizing our practice and reduce where there ever is disparate treatment reducing it sort of the equal other equal side of that coin is also if the one thing is I hope bad things aren't happening to folks in a disparate way um, and unfairly then the other point would be it would be wonderful if all our students on a, I guess on average meaning there's no nothing in the data that looks weird or funny um, are equally advantaging themselves of the enrichment courses and opportunities that we have as a as a district, and so um, as you, I'm just saying this because you know that's the one I brought up before. Uh, it would be it'd be great to understand and being able to have a realistic, quantitative and qualitative understanding of, you know, what do our our classes look like in the high school level in terms of taking advantage of. Um, and actually, I'd expand, I mean, I think talking about AP uh, and honors courses is great. I'd also want to ask the question of whether there are other kinds of enrichment activities that can 
substantially advance an individual as a person, um, how are kids doing in terms of taking it? You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. like there, there can be arts and dance and music courses that that it turns out that that's the thing that turns someone on and it adds to their quality of life and it gives them an exposure to things and culture or ability that they might not otherwise have. And You know what I mean? So there's, they're, 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 at the core you can have honors and AP, but beyond that there are other ways in which you want, you'd love to know that all students, to the best we're able to accomplish that goal, are able to advantage themselves of it. And that's a conversation that I think we, should, we need to have and we should be having. Um, do you have any, I mean, looking at the time and the clock in the absence of further questions from the, oh, we have one, we have two. Uh, after those two, um, if you had anything you guys wanted to talk about around what you were thinking of, um, that'd be valuable to do. Since this isn't the end of the conversation, we're going to have it again. Ms. Spitzer and then Ms. Donald. Okay. Um, so one of, I just want to reiterate, I share all these goals. I think it's great that you've been doing this for five years. And I'm only trying to kind of go deeper into them because I think they are important. And I think if we're going to adopt them, we should make sure that we do it properly. And we make sure that they're um, achievable and, and something that we can get a lot of support from the community for because it's not just going to be us. It's going to need to be the entire school system that's going to have to motivate and, and, and move to make this these changes that I think are important. Um, so, like, for example, with number five, I think this is an excellent goal. Increasing the enrollment and success of students of color and low-income white students and honors and AP classes in the high school, but I feel like so much of the groundwork needs to happen starting probably in kindergarten, probably some of the evidence shows in pre-K. So, um, how can we, is, is there a way that we can try to, or get, you know, go across these, um, I mean, the, we have the regional issues here, but then also the elementary and the middle school. So, um, I just want to highlight that it seems like a lot to put on the superintendent to bring people up to achieving at the AP or honors level if for some reason they're not um, prepared, and that's a problem that our community should be addressing, but I think we need to think about this within the, the bigger context. And then the um, other thing I was thinking, we do this um, the survey, so is there a way that maybe we could introduce some self-report data on discipline or some self-report data on, you know, do I feel like I'm encouraged to take some, you know, is there a way that we can make, you know, data collection is so burdensome. If we're already doing the survey annually with students, is there a way we could maybe get some of the questions to reflect these goals and to try to get some of that longitudinal data to see if it's changing in the eyes of the students. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking is going back to the first one, you know, and like I said, I've been working in healthcare and one of the things they do is often something called audit and feedback where like if a doctor is over prescribing certain like opiates, for example, um, at a hospital, they'll privately be sharing with that doctor like, you know, you're prescribing a lot more opiates than your um, other doctor in the ED. So maybe we want to um, <coughs> do it and that kind of motivates people because I'm hoping, my hope is that most of the teachers who are doing this are not consciously trying to penalize kids. So maybe, I, I don't know if that's a model, like a, it's a model in healthcare, I don't know if it's something that's already being in practice here, but it seems like it might be a good good thing to think about um, potentially doing. You know, it, your points are really good, and we have to start somewhere. Yeah. So that if we collect the data, and there's three kids of color who are in the entire honors and AP program, we say, there's a problem here. And you know, the solution will take a long time. It's deep and breadth and you know, wide. And but you know, we're committed and we figure and you chisel and you do it step by step. The other thing is why par is exactly that, which is students are asked their own questions and then they do their own research, and then they share the results. And it's exactly that, and it would be killing many birds with one stone. So, because you'd be collecting data, you'd be empowering students to learn how to research, you'd be empowering students to ask their own questions, and you'd be also getting a real hit about climate, social climate, uh, academic climate. Um, and then there was one other thing you said that was, um, oh, and then the self, 
the, the peer staff. That's exactly why we're encouraging these peer staff, faculty, to support each other, to do this sort. And it takes training and it takes commitment, but that there are these little kind of self-reflective affinity groups or self-study groups to do just that. You know, with maybe a mentor, not completely alone, but so all those things. Yes, yes, yes. Ms. McDonald. Um, my, it was more a comment, not really a question. So I'm um, a member of the SDTF, but only um, I've only been able to attend one meeting. So, um, but I do um, the what I really appreciate about the work that you've done is this focus, as you've as you've repeatedly said, on on starting somewhere and laying the ground the ground um, foundation for collecting the data and and defining and actually creating a common definition of what the issue is and what the problem is and where we need to improve or change. Because um, I think that's something that's um, been missing and, and so we've had a lot of stories, a lot of conversation, but without having and sort of forcing ourselves to come to some common definition and defining both where we are starting and where we want to go, um, clearly and precisely data as well, both quantitative and qualitative, is really helpful in moving us forward on this. So. Um, so I appreciate it. I know I'm part of it, but I, it's you, you guys have done all the work up until now. Um, and I do think that as a next step, focusing on some of these areas where um, the group has been um, uh, vague isn't the right word, but imprecise in some ways and figuring out ways to be more precise as we outline that, um, what the goals will be. Um, so that we're defining that up front and not sort of at the end of the year, well, this was the way we were able to collect the data. And I think um, putting that focus over the next, um, before the next meeting, sort of to try and define what we can do and what we can collect and measure ourselves against, I think will be really helpful. Yeah, I was just going to say oh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have any thoughts you have in terms of, both of you have, in terms of follow-up and then move on on the agenda only because I suspect we're going to bring this back for our next meeting and stuff and so we'll keep the conversation going. Yeah, so um, a couple thoughts and I'll be brief. One is, um, you know, it was already mentioned before I got to it, but I think the climate survey we did uh, and at the high school and we'll be implementing again at the high school to make it an annual data source as well as a middle school, which was an idea that came from SATF a number of years ago. I do think that is valuable data as well. It's not in conflict with this is actually telling a broader story because when our students, to the point you raise, when our students are voicing how they experience the school, that's some of the best data that we can collect. I think um, I think the only other comment I'd make, I mean, um, and I know we'll come back to this, is just you know a, a caution or a concern, you know, um, that there's uh, Cunningham's too probably modest to say it, but just there's no data analyst in Ms. Cunningham's department. And so when we're talking about collecting data and this data, some of the concern that I have isn't around the request because they all, I mean, we, there's logistics to work out, there's clarity that we have to, but but it's, it's some of it's around capacity. Um, and so I want to voice that here. Um, we've, and I don't want to get into a huge budget conversation of the last couple of years, but, but I want to say uh, in response that any apprehension that, that I express or that we express is not around the intent, because the intent is we are fully in agreement. It's the question is what's the capacity, you know? Um, and so that's what we have to work out, not around do we think these things are good things to collect or bad things to collect, because I think we're very much on the same page as, as you and it seems like the committee. And, you know, with a lot less staff, what, what are we able to collect and what are we able to collect well? And that's why those definition statements of what we're collecting are so important. Anything further? So uh, one thing I'd say is that earlier at the be beginning of the meeting, I think before you were in here, uh, I made the comment that the data trend subcommittee should probably get ginned up again because it, it could integrate with the strategic planning process. Uh, and my assumption is that, that these, whatever else we do, that these recommendations or goals are going to be in some ways integrated or reflected in the strategic plan. I mean, even organically, like you come to the meetings, you talk there at it, and they're built in, right? And so then the question, the question about how we end up gaining or finding capacity to track what we need to track. I mean, in other words, mm -hmm. I'm not. 
you know, no one's going to make money appear underneath the desk somewhere around here. Um, so I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it's really part of the question writ large of it if we have a nice strategic plan. That's going to include lots of things that we need to measure and track over time. How are we ever going to measure and track them? And, and this is the classic problem that I've had in planning work is so frequently what you do is you end up tracking the things that you have as data, not the things you need. Right. And then they, they don't necessarily tell you, they may or may not, obviously some data is great, but it may or may not then tell you anything significant about what you really wanted to learn, right? right? And, I, and the, the, the reality is that's just the world we live in. Yeah. And so it's almost, it's only a partially solvable problem, but if you don't sit down and address it, it's completely unsolved problem, right. right? So, so I want to I want to put that front and center as something that we should be talking about going into the budget season, because because what it, where it aligns with ASCTF goals that are being presented, it aligns with everything else we're trying to do strategically right. as well. And so I think we need to talk about that, and that getting the SIP committee going for that reason is also good, because it means that the school committee should hopefully be engaged and integrated with this conversation about what we do, where where it fits with budgeting and other things. Yes, it's coming. So along with that committee, I'd like to add that maybe the policy committee should look at some of this because if they are looking for this to be something that's ingrained in our district, whether Dr. Morris or me, if we're st whether or not we're still here, right. we should look at um, making these into policies. That's true. Too. Um, so what's we'll, we'll, to be continued? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Taking the time. Part of our work is that we can go from 15 minutes ahead of time to 10 minutes behind, like that. It's like magic. Uh, our but topics are already done. Oh no no no! And this is and this was this is terrific. No, this I'm I'm kidding around. This is terrific too, and also uh, that's a, that's a conversation that's not only important but um, needs the time it got. Uh, so next on our agenda is athletic facilities strategic plan. We appreciate Mr. Zomek's you know, patience. I, I sit where can you sit with the microphone? <laughs> you're, you're giving it. It, it bends. You can. I want. Yeah, I want you to be as comfortable as possible. You can even take your jacket off if you want. So, well, Mr. Zomek's getting yes. seated. Um, I just want to thank. Um, He's this, Mr. Zolmik is this, and he can explain this, but I'll say it, the assistant town manager in Amherst, but he was, uh, along with Mr. Sullivan um, and a number of other folks, uh, Mr. Farrow had to go um, to coach. Um, so he was here, but the timing didn't work for him to stay. Uh, part of a group that um, looked at our field, as you'll find out about, and there was a meeting, and you, you've seen these slides from October 3rd, Mr. Sullivan was present for, as a school committee rep, um, that was a partnership of the town and the regional school district. So just for people who weren't clear on the history, this is a while ago there was a capital request um, to study this, and this is one of the products of that study, or probably the primary product of that study. It was funded, I want to say it was two years ago, but yep. I'm looking at Mr. Sullivan. Two years ago was capital request um, to take a look at these fields, and some of them are owned by the region, and some of them are owned by the town of Amherst, so it just made sense to have a, par sense to have a partnership, and we appreciate and Mr. Sullivan. Can Sullivan's I ask work. a question then? Is, um, is it anticipated that some elements of this plan might be pr come forward in our annual capital budget, capital plan budget that will be looking at? In a couple months? I think this will set the stage for those conversations, absolutely. I, the reason I brought that up now is so that way the committee, when they're listening to you, can be thinking, oh, I get how this fits with what happens next. I don't have anything left to say. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> the stage has been set. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, as Mike said, I, Dr. Morris said, I am Dave Zomek, uh, Assistant Town Manager. Happy to be here tonight. Um, I wanted to start off with an image as I was get, coming around the corner to the to the high school. Um, I noticed that the girls' soccer game was being played on the football field, mm -hmm. and I want everybody uh, here tonight and and uh, viewing this in the future just to think about that. That's actually a first for me. I've never seen uh, that soccer team playing on that field, but we're going to get around to that in this presentation as to why that's happened. I think I think the committee knows, but um, it's it's an important part and element of of the work we've done. So as Dr. Morris said, uh, over the last two years, the Recreation Working Group 
uh, has been uh, diligently studying uh, the fields. And what we have uh, on the screen um, here, if I can, does this have a pointer mic or no? Which is, okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, so what we have here is, is really the main focus area of the work that the Recreation Working Group uh, looked at, and that is uh, the, the fields and facilities at Community Field, uh, the, the high school and the middle school fields. Um, and as I said, this work began about two years ago, uh, and in that time, uh, we brought together uh, representatives of, of this committee, of the LSSE Commission, uh, DPW, um, a number of sports teams in Amherst, and we all began to really talk about uh, both what we have currently in terms of fields and facilities in Amherst and what we need. Um, and what we quickly realized is that we needed help. And luckily, through CPA funding and through the region, we were able, uh, as was mentioned earlier, to put together a funding package and hire Weston and Sampson. And they are a leading uh, firm of landscape architects uh, out of Boston. They do a tremendous amount of work on fields and facilities, particularly for municipalities, for schools, for private clubs, et cetera. So what I wanted to do tonight was quickly run through a slide set, just highlighting some of the, uh, the main points of the work they did. Um, this is actually not the final product. This is really a visual product that we can use here tonight in other meetings, but they are actually compiling an entire report on their findings, both kind of the history of what they looked at and what we presented to them, and that they will make recommendations for some of the scenarios you'll see here tonight. They'll also make funding recommendations. Um, they'll also make uh, recommendations on such things as um, what should our maintenance plan be for the typical football field, natural turf, how much does that cost in New England to maintain a natural turf football field? How much does it cost to maintain an artificial turf football field or soccer field, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, they'll also, they've also compiled data, which is crucial, on how much the fields are used on a yearly basis and by which teams, both school teams as well as recreational teams through LSSC, through Amherst Baseball, Amherst Soccer, Amherst Ultimate, et cetera. So, as far as I know, this is the first comprehensive study that has been done, certainly in my 14, 15 years with the town, of all of our fields. So really excited to present some of that data here tonight. This will all be uh, compiled later in November, early December, uh, and put together in a, a report for all of us to view. So let me quickly buzz through some of the slides, and then we'll open it up for questions. I know that the athletic director, uh, Rich Farrow, was here earlier. He had to go, uh, actually, a uh, uh, we have a work-related uh, commitment. Uh, I know uh, Principal Mark Jackson is with us, and, and if there are questions, uh, Mr. Mangano also participated in this, uh, in this work, so if there are questions that uh, any of the three of us can answer. So let me quickly go through. So the focus area was really community field, the high school, and the middle school. We're really gonna focus on the high school and community field tonight, uh, frankly, because that's where um, most of our practices and games happen, and honestly, that's where most of the work needs to be done. So I'm gonna buzz fairly quickly. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of these slides. As I said, this is about a two year uh, effort um, by uh, about 15 people representing a, a broad range of, of interests and concerns and uh, energy uh, regarding recreation in Amherst. Um, as we said, Weston and Sampson looked at all the fields in town, including Mill River, Groff Park, Kiwanis Park. Um, so as part of their study, they're actually gonna compile all of that data for us. And believe it or not, you may not be aware, but our teams from the high school and the middle school also practice at some of the town fields uh, in South Amherst and in North Amherst. But again, the main focus will be right outside the front door here of Amherst Regional as we talk tonight. But here's a listing of all the, the uh, uh, facilities that they did look at. So again, the core properties are the high school and the middle school. You can see here that what is represented is what is town land versus what is region. Region here at the middle school and then town both at the Hawthorne property and the middle school. Um, I think you're all familiar with the layout, but just quickly because I'm gonna be buzzing through some of these slides, but uh, we have the, the main 90-foot uh, diamond baseball field here, football field, softball field, uh, the pool, the War Memorial pool, the track, 
various practice fields, the lacrosse field. There's a there's a uh, a funny name for the lacrosse field. I forgot what they call it, the swamp or something like that. Do they call it the the snake pit? Uh, yes, which came up at multiple meetings. We had uh, we, uh, it actually slopes off in one corner toward the wetland out back, and it's kind of a home field advantage for our lacrosse players. Um, we had uh, a number of stu uh, students who participated in athletics and play on these fields come to the public meetings that we held, so it was really nice to get their feedback as well. Um, as I said, we, we do have a plan for redoing the fields at Wildwood, Hawthorne, and the middle school, but I don't think uh, we're gonna focus much on that tonight. I'm happy to come back at a, at a future date. So, condition. Um, I think you've all heard probably through the years from many of our athletes, um, the, the conditions we have in Amherst are challenging. Uh, we uh, have gone out and we have talked with and looked at other fields in the region, talking with other athletic directors and, and uh, 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 teams throughout the region, and we certainly have discovered very quickly that our fields and, and facilities, including the track, are in uh, fair to poor shape for the most part. One of the, the two key pieces that we focused on with Weston and Sampson was safety and access. And as we buzz through some of these slides, it, and if you've had children or, or friends and family participate in sports here, particularly on the fields outside the, the doors here at Amherst Regional, you'll realize very quickly that um, our fields are in quite challenging shape, particularly the soccer field inside the track. The track itself is in very poor condition, as I think you know from various <coughs> capital reports. Um, and our accessibility is, uh, as Weston and Sampson uh, stated, rated quite poorly. It is very difficult for people with disabilities to get to any of our fields. Um, I'm thinking of the field named after my dad, Zomac Baseball Field. You know the sloped uh, 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 layout of that field. Uh, there's nowhere to sit. There's no way, way to get down because of drainage issues, uh, the slope of the fields. There's no bituminous pavement. There's no pathways. Likewise, to get out to the track, um, it's virtually impossible for someone with, with a, a, in a wheelchair or with a disability. So we focused a lot on safety and access. Uh, and we looked at all of those fields. And I'm just showing you some of the, um, the, the, the current state of some of these fields in, in these photos. Yes? Can you just explain the difference between the regional fields and what community field actually oh, yes. consists of? That's a great point. Um, let me go back one. So um, many people in Amherst don't really understand the difference between what the town owns, which is this and this. Uh, this is where War Memorial Pool is, the uh, varsity softball field, the football field, and our 90-foot diamond, um, and the old playground that desperately needs to be uh, redone. That is all town-owned land. Likewise, uh, to the north, the region owns the fields behind the high school, the track, and the associated uh, field sport area, as well as some of the practice fields uh, to the north of Mattoon Street. Through the years, we've had informal relationships. There is no MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, that I'm aware of that defines who uses what when. It's always been a collaborative, cooperative understanding. So. Um, for instance, the varsity baseball team has priority on Zomek Field, on that diamond, even though it's owned by the town. So town leagues can't get on that field until the varsity is done with a game or a practice or whatever. Um, so there's been a, a good collaborative relationship at sharing these fields through the years, which is admirable. That doesn't happen in every town. But it's important as we looked at these fields to think about how we could gain efficiency in more efficiency in sharing those fields. One of the big challenges, as, as we know, much of Amherst is very wet. This entire area, and I have some of the old photos, was a swamp. And you can actually tell that not much, uh, when, when these fields were built, they were designed and engineered for drainage uh, approaches at the time, probably back in the 1950s and 60s. 
we know full well that these fields do not drain well at all, particularly the field in the, in the middle of the track. These fields are often wet. So the teams, and if uh, Mr. Farrow was here, he would tell you how we are often behind other schools in getting onto our fields in the spring because they're simply too wet. So we looked at drainage issues, uh, engineering issues. Uh, as many of you may also know, there is a very large culvert that goes under these fields that pulls the water and drains the water from all the way up near the middle school, and that is the Tan Brook, and takes it all the way through the northern part of town, through the campus pond, and into the Mill River. So all of this was once a wetland that has been drained many, many years ago, but it is still retains many of the characteristics of that old wetland. So shared fields, the best we can do. Weston and Sampson said, we can do better with different um, um, arrangements of these fields. Um, again, I'm not gonna focus much on that. So we know that the condition of our fields generally are poor. Um, I would call the baseball field probably good. We've done some improvements there, but soccer, lacrosse, ultimate are in poor shape. Moving along quickly, a war memorial pool. We, we've done some renovation on that uh, pool, but we know it needs more. So here's some of our field notes. I'm not gonna go into um, great detail on any of these, but we, we wanted to focus on improving the facilities, access safety, um, and making them more efficient for town use and for school use. I won't go into great detail here, but you've seen that. We looked at field types as well. What kind of field types do we have and what types of fields in terms of size do we want? Again, I won't go into detail, but essentially what we want is more multi-purpose fields. Our fields don't fit the sports <coughs> we're playing on them. The field inside the track, which we often consider our best soccer field, if you will, which is now closed, um, is not regulation high school soccer. It's too small. So we've been playing on that for years. Has it ever mattered? I don't think so, but if, if one were really uh, by the book, if you will, we might not be able to host tournaments on that field because it's not a regulation size. So Weston and Sampson wanted to design some alternatives for us that have multi-purpose fields that fit the sports that we have and that are gaining in popularity. So we're gonna move along to very quickly to some of the different options. And I, again, I don't have much time and I wanna leave time for questions, but this was option one. I think you saw this. Um, uh, and what the, the core elements here, again, we wanted to focus on safety, efficiency, <coughs> and access. So what this shows really is the most dramatic change is moving the track and creating a multi-purpose field just to the west of the high school in a north-south orientation. The current soccer field uh, that is used sometimes for other sports as well, but mainly soccer, is oriented the wrong way. An east-west orientation is not the proper orientation because when the sun sets during different parts of the year, it actually uh, obscures the, the vision of goalies in particular. Likewise, our, so our softball field is oriented east, our current softball field, varsity softball field, which is right here, is also oriented incorrectly. So this option one does a number of things. It creates a large multi-purpose field here that can be played on by ultimate soccer, lacrosse, football, any field sport can play on that field. We have not made any recommendation on artificial turf or natural turf. That will come in the report from Weston and Sampson, but that's a decision for the community to make in the future. We also moved the women's softball um, uh, field facility over in this corner, orienting it north-south. Um, I'll go into some of the other details in a few minutes on some of the next schemes. Um, this was option two. Um, a lot of the same goals we were trying to achieve. Uh, we move the track and field facility farther west. This has some advantages, some disadvantages, and we create multi-purpose practice and playing fields alongside it between the high school and that field. Um, we also create a multi-purpose field out back. Um, and in this area, what we're talking about is enhancing 
the options for young families to use both community field and uh, create a space there that includes a playground, a small splash pad, splash park, and all throughout you will see these tan walkways. We've designed what amount to a, a likely a couple of miles of walking paths that people can use for exercise. And along the way, you could, you could bring a stroller, someone could be in a wheelchair, you could run on it. Along the way are exercise pods where you can stop and do push-ups or sit-ups or stretch um, throughout the entire facility here, both on the town land and the, and the regional land. Option three is probably the most radical, and you always ask uh, your consultant to kind of go big or go home. Um, on this one, actually, we said probably no, go home. We don't <laughs> like this one. And what it did was it moved the, the football or multi-purpose facility uh, on and over and taking the place of the baseball field here and it moved the 90-foot diamond uh, varsity baseball field to this corner of Mattoon Street um, and again moved softball here and created that kind of complex and ultimately that wasn't what the committee recommended. The final version, the preferred version, really was more like option one um, and again what this does is it takes advantage of the natural topography of the field just to the west of the Amherst High School. Uh, you, you know, there's a hill there, so we can actually build bleachers into the hill there. We would build some bleachers and seating into the 90-foot diamond at Zomek Field. You can see there are walkways around all of the field, allowing people with disabilities to access those fields. Um, what this also does is it creates a field house right here that would serve both the pool and all of the other fields. So say you're having a weekend tournament and you have teams coming. I know we have an ultimate tournament or a lacrosse tournament, whatever it might be. Teams could actually change here. There would be restrooms in there, changing rooms, and head right out into the fields. As it currently stands, we have a very modest comfort station over here in this corner, and then teams actually have to go into the high school. So the high school has to be opened every time we have some sort of a tournament. This would make it much simpler, much easier for teams to go right to the field house, change, um, get suited up, and head right out into the field. So this is the preferred option that we're moving forward with in our recommendations. So from that, um, looking a little bit more closely, this is just a little bit more detail. Um, I think one of the other features that uh, Weston and Samson did for us was they actually made arrival areas. In other words, when people come to Amherst High School for a, a community uh, a game or a, a high school game, you're not really sure where to go or have you arrived. And can we create spaces that allow us to actually uh, determine where people park? And can, if we're charging a fee for a game or a tournament, so what they did is they've actually made uh, real arrival points here and here and here so that we can kind of control. And then over, there was, there's one off the screen here so that we can kind of have better control <coughs> and there's a real sense that you've arrived at the high school in this, in this community event space that, that we share with, with the high school and the region. Um, so, this, you might ask, how many, what kind of a plan is this? What, what's, what's, what's the year, what's the year, uh, what's, the, what's the timeline? We don't have a formal timeline, but clearly this is probably a 10 to 15 year plan. I want to make that clear. We don't have uh, unrealistic expectations. We understand the capital needs in the town, we understand the operating needs. Um, so we envision this to be a 10 to 15 year plan. So what we asked Weston and Sampson to do is give us a sense of priorities. And clearly the priority that came through time and time again as we were in discussions in public meetings was the need for a new track and a multi-purpose field that could efficiently serve town sports as well as regional sports. And that's what they came up with in uh, phase one of this 10 to 15 year plan. Um, and again, phase one would focus on creating one element of the preferred plan, and that is having the track and field facility just west of the high school 
and then regrading all of the other fields around those so that they could be prepared for the next phase. Um, we would not do anything uh, south of Mattoon Street because, frankly, it's just not a priority. The baseball field is in reasonable shape. The softball is a, uh, field is in reasonable shape. The real need is north of Mattoon Street um, on the region's land. Um, so that naturally led us to getting a range of costs. Um, and so let me start with, we asked Weston and Sampson what it would cost, and these are approximate numbers. We, this, was just, uh, this presentation was just made on October 3rd, so we have not had a chance to work more deeply on these numbers with them. But just to renovate the existing track and field in place, add bleacher seating, make it ADA, and all of that, they were really in the $2 million range to do that. So right now, we believe that just to do the track in the east-west orientation, which is an improper orientation on a field that needs serious work, would probably be in the order of $2 million, $2.5 million. So we then asked them to, to give us a range, depending on what amenities we asked for in this. Um, and again, we realize that $6 million is not something that is going to happen here, but we wanted to present a range. But to do a reasonable, uh, practical uh, uh, phase one would probably be in the three to $4 million range, reorienting the track north to south and doing uh, as much of this work with new bleachers, new track, shot put discus, all of the field sports, as well as a multi-purpose field. Now, again, these ranges would would increase or decrease based on whether you do natural turf or whether you do artificial turf. Um, and that's a decision that we have not made as a group. I think there will be a recommendation coming to you and the town in the coming months. So we believe it's probably two million plus to do the field as it is, three to four million to do it in the preferred location with brand new everything, <coughs> bleachers, and a multi-purpose field. Let's see. And I think that's really where I want to stop. We have lots more data on the middle school, but I think tonight we just wanted to focus on phase one and the high school. And we might have an opportunity to come back to this conversation again later. I hope we will. Yeah, well, certainly. Yes, yes. So are there questions from the committee? Professor? Okay. Um, so thank you for this presentation. Um, I guess one of the more concerning things I heard was the fact that we've built on what probably should have never had these fields built on it from what I'm hearing about like the wetlands and some of these structural issues being about the, the nature of the land we're building on and given climate change and, and we just went for a really wet season. I, I'm just wondering like what were their opinions on the, you know, investing so much in this land that you know, may not be the best place to put a field, and was there any conversation about whether or not these fields should be relocated to a more appropriate spot? I, probably the town doesn't own land that would be, I mean, given what you've said about, I know some of those other fields also face issues around being really wet, but just if we're gonna be investing this kind of money. Sure, no, it's a, great, it's a great question. I appreciate the question. Um, let me start by saying Amherst is probably one of the wettest towns in Massachusetts. We are blessed with a lot of water. We are blessed with the Mill River in the north, the Fort River in the south, and all of the tributaries that connect and, and, and um, are throughout our town. Um, most of the land that we've currently built on, that we've built our houses on roads, was once either wet or farmland, or actually wet farmland. Um, many of the, the crop farmers actually left Amherst many, you know, generations ago, because they realized they couldn't really grow many crops here. It was great for growing cows. At one time, we had 55 dairy farms in Amherst. Think about it, 55 dairy farms. We have one now. Cows simply needed pasture land. It was primarily wet. So much of this space, many of the spaces that we currently use for our houses and our schools and, and whatnot are wetter than, than <coughs> normal. Um, at no time did we or Weston and Sampson think that this site could not be engineered with current building practices to be drier 
and uh, more sustainable in terms of the playing surfaces. Um, it is not, um, you know, there's no question we could reuse the site. And frankly, it makes sense, I think, from a sustainability si standpoint. We looked at this as, as part of the core educational um, uh, facilities of the town with Wildwood, the middle school, and the high school. And then we looked at the fields around them and said, it makes sense for us to invest in these fields. Honestly, and I said this on October 3rd, I believe it makes more sense for us to invest in these fields than some of our outlying fields. So if we collectively, the region and the town, put funding into this over the next 15 years, we may not look at Groff Park seven, eight, 10 years from now and say, we really want a regulation soccer field there. Because frankly, if we do what this plan calls for, Groff Park may be a wonderful recreation area, informal. It'll have a spray park by then. We're building that in the spring. But I don't believe we'll need to invest $2 million in Groff Park to bring it up to speed. It is also wet and challenging topographically and whatnot, but I don't think we'll need that. So from a sustainability standpoint and an investment standpoint, I believe we should invest in Wildwood, the middle school, and the high school fields. So I'm going to take a couple more questions and then potentially move on depending on the volume of the questions. Samina. Will these fields be dry? Uh, I noticed about well, maybe 10, 15 years ago, Amherst College rebuilt their fields on Route 9 by raising the, the road, the, the fields, by five feet. They had great big drainage uh, uh, tapes in there. Will these be dry? Will be, the wet should be addressed? Yes. Um, so a great follow-up. The practices that were used, you know, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s um, are not the same as we currently use today. So there's no question that these fields, if some of them w would be natural turf, there may be a recommendation for one or more of them to be artificial turf. But we'll cross that, that bridge when we come to it. But there's no question that we can engineer these fields to be drier than they are. Some of them have no drainage at all. Um, and water this year was very plentiful. Two years ago, in 2016, this, uh, the, the field uh, in, the soccer, uh, in, the, in the track was like a desert and was hard as a rock, and we were concerned that students were going to get hurt playing on this very hard surface, in part because we have a very old irrigation system out there. So we, we, they were engineered for, with the technology of the, of the time period. That has changed dramatically. Um, I would be, I think, remiss if not mentioning that I think many members of the committee will, will recommend one or more turf fields be considered for that re very reason, that we can engineer a turf field. It can be used eight, nine months of the year. Um, it doesn't need the same kind of maintenance that uh, a natural turf field needs. Um, Honestly, we're not even caring for our fields. We're not investing in our fields the way Weston and Sampson will report that we should be. We don't have the money for fertilizer, uh, irrigation, proper drainage, et cetera. So a turf field may be a more economical option down the road, and many teams can play on that one, one field while resting some of the natural turf fields. That's another problem is we don't have enough good fields in the core to even rest some of the fields. Other questions? I just have a comment Please. on the safety of the fields. I was at that public meeting two weeks ago on that Wednesday, and I was horrified to learn that there's four season-ending injuries each season on that field now, and that's totally unacceptable. Well, I don't know, Mr. Jackson and, and Dr. Morris may know more about that. I know it was referenced that there's been four season-ending injuries. I don't think it's, it's per year, but that, I, well, I'm, I think over the last couple of years, I'm not sure. But I don't know. I don't know the distribution yeah. as well across the years, right? I, I would agree with Mr. Zomek. That's not one year. That's not a one-year vote. Right? Yeah. Okay. I, I heard it wrong then the other yeah. night. But, but again, if we that. just... I think thinking back to 16, the, the, the contrast between 2016 when we had a rock hard field, this year we have a, 
what's essentially a swamp and we, you know, kids are sinking in when they're out there running full tilt. Yeah. The fields are not engineered to current standards. This plan suggests a path forward to engineer them and so that they can be more efficiently used. After it rains, if this were a turf field, you can play on it. Moments after it stopped rains, be, raining because the drainage takes that water away. Right. Yeah, if I could just add to Mr. Sullivan's comment in that dialogue, you know, and you know this because I've shared it electronically with the committee, but we had, there were so many concerns about the field this year that we had uh, an official come and evaluate the field, and essentially they said it was playable, but they couldn't guarantee the safety, so we've not been using it. So the comment that actually both of you made separately about <coughs> seeing the soccer game on the football field today was based on we're always going to make decisions in the interest of student safety, and the field had been so wet that it's gotten to the point where the unevenness <coughs> of the field was, was not possible to manage, and that's why we've shifted some games that were home games to away games, and occasionally when that hasn't been possible to do, uh, as, as was referenced here, to use other fields that are not regulation and they're not perfect, but from a safety perspective, they're better. Uh, I, I also want to highlight, um, it wasn't referenced here, but we've talked about it in the past, the track is, is also an area of concern that we're, we've... Yes. we've had officials question whether we could host meets on our track because of the condition of the track and the f not just the track but the field areas as well. And um, some of the images that were shown in the slide deck show some of those gaps where we're, you know, patching essentially a track and uh, uh, quite a bit of experience with that. And, and patching a track, uh, first of all, it doesn't last. And second of all, it leads to uneasy unevenness like the moment after you patch yeah. it because that's the nature of it. And so so we have multiple – I just want to be really clear because the, the – the, sticker shock on this slide when people are watching it will be high and uh, what we have now is not sustainable and you know when we're having this level of safety concerns about student athletes um, you know all of our um, concerns go up significantly it's not a beautification I mean that might be an, a possible outcome but I like the framing that Mr. Zelmick used it's about safety and access and that's really been the framing that we we've used um, throughout the process. Well I've only I've only been on the committee two years I think today might actually be my anniversary Congratulations! Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> but the um, but but we've been this is the third this year is going to be the third cycle where we've been talking about our sports fields, and just even this being the third year, every year the condition is reported to be worse and worse, yeah. and it becoming more significant a challenge in terms of things like whether it's going to be even allowable right. to to play based on um, you know the, the requirements around safety. And concerns that the leagues will have. And so, I mean, I think it's a great thing to have a plan, particularly think long-term and make our all of our fields work better, more collaboratively, and more effectively over time. I think the funny thing is, is it's one of those things where I'm looking forward to the next step because uh, we need we need to move on. I mean, it's clear that we need to move on this. I think the other question would be, which I'm also grateful that the report includes questions about ongoing maintenance and things like that, because that's always, that's always like the one thing that's always forgotten. Like build the shiny bobble and you'll worry about maintenance, you know, in 10 years or five years or something. And, but also part of it is that I think if you look at it from that perspective, it's possible that, you know, you buy now for the price that you need to pay, but over time you're going to see um, lower costs for upkeep and the ability to, you know, have, you know, you need to do this basically for, for a long, and fiscally it can work out in the long run. But, are there other? Yes, please. I just wanted to conclude, and, and I couldn't agree more with many of the comments uh, of the committee and, and Dr. Morris. Um, again, I wanted to emphasize that this is a long-range, long-term plan. We're very realistic. The committee is very realistic. Um, I feel very good that we have a plan. I said on October 3rd, um, what would we do if we knew we needed a new track, the soccer field was failing, and we didn't have any of this information. So I'm very grateful to you all, to Town Meeting, for supporting the work of Weston and Sampson and this volunteer group that came together of staff and, and community members. Um, we're in a great position, I think, now to plan for the future. And I think it was said at the outset, this is really meant to inform capital planning. We're looking forward to working with, with Mr. Bockelman and, and his staff uh, on the town side, uh, Dr. Morris, uh, Mr. Mangano, uh, and Mr. Jackson on the on the school side and all of you to really say, okay, what is the plan moving forward? What can we afford? What are the priorities? 
we will put together what we believe are recommendations to you, to the new town council, um, and we hope this will provide a great foundation for decision making in 2019. And we come in with our eyes wide open. We realize these are big numbers. We need to work these numbers, so I would just caution you all a little bit and those watching, we need to work these a little bit more. We don't have them all uh, down to the down to the the, uh, the nitty gritty, but we will get there in the next couple of weeks, and we'll have a written document for you that we'll obviously send out electronically. So I, I thank you for your time and and look forward to future meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is everyone good? Okay. You want us to keep rolling? Or? Yes, keep going. Two minute break. You want a two minute break? Keep going. Yeah, okay. We're gonna take. No, I don't care. Slight break. break. <laughs> In session, um, Principal Slobin. Good evening. Good evening. Good Thanks evening. for being here. This Thank is a topic of great interest, interest for us, as you know. No, I, I, I feel kind of, you know, this is great. <laughs> I'm ready for the next step. I feel like we've gone through it together, all of us. Yeah, no, this is this so. is really important. Are, are, you, are you out of the old Yeah, room? so I was going to kind of say, we're here. You know, we're, we are here. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> uh, most importantly, the Sox are up 8-2. Oh, they are. JBJ with a grand slam. Awesome. Um, <laughs> just, you know. We like to. Did you get down the slides yet? No, 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 no. We're a little behind on the slides. Yeah, we're here. Thanks to lots of people. And uh, one really important guy is right there, and I don't want to miss him because he was working his butt off all summer, excuse me. Uh, John Cody, right there. And, and he just deserves a lot of hands. Um, so uh, I'll try to keep this brief so you guys can have questions, but we made it. Not only did we make it in the summer, some of you know this, we got our greenhouse over, the kids got it over, and, and that was great. Um, so just, there's our, our, you know, there's our sign. Um, uh, you know, we had a few rough spots. Um, and, and we'll, you know, and then that, I guess some of it's predictable, right? So we didn't, we didn't have everything done, and we're still kind of completing that. That was, that was a challenge, but uh, it was met, right? And so uh, we had to deal with, so when you're dealing with these transitions, it's nice to have everything in order and then kind of do it, but we had to deal with that. And the kids, <coughs> I'm so proud of the students because they were already challenged by the transition already. And they came in and like most things, they're the most resilient. And the staff, uh, we got some great new staff and our current staff just ha have, have risen to the occasion. Also, central office people, um, really, we couldn't have done it without them. Uh, with Dr. Morris, Sean Mangano, um, we just, uh, we needed that help, and they helped, and uh, it showed that kind of community effort, and so we're really pleased about that. Um, Mr. Jackson has been uh, amazing. I got Dr. Brady, Mr. Jackson, thank you. Um, uh, but Mr. Jackson, we, we've... Uh, We've been able to meet with their staff. We've been able to continue a, a conversation that we think is, is really important. And um, those lovely flowers that you see right there was only part of a, a, a major day over Labor Day that was really run by, by Dr. Brady. And without Dr. Brady really taking the reins, uh, I think we would have been kind of uh, short-circuited. So, so another real big hand for Dr. Brady. I really appreciate that. Uh, and has been with us the whole time. So I'm really, really pleased about that. So just a, a couple fun things. So we, 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 you know, as you know, we moved into this kitchen and we've, we've had cooking for years. Now we have this incredible professional kitchen and, um, and we're using it. And so those pies that you see, which we could have never done at our old kitchen, actually happened on uh, the day that uh, Mr. Jackson and I got dunked uh, when we had a whole, what do you guys call that, field day? Community day, and, and it, what was wonderful was this community day, m my students who were new to the school were able to go out in the community with their friends and, and do it, or stay in and make these pizzas, right? And they chose it. It was up to them, and it, it just worked out you know, incredibly, and, and I'm just pleased about that. And so um, it's something that was, that, that's been extra, extra special, and we're, we'll continue to use that. Next week, we are having a grand opening, kind of a soft opening, 
to our mountaintop bistro. And, and you know, it's our cafeteria and it's, it's kind of the vision of the future, right? And so we, we want to make, uh, you know, there, it's a small kind of leap, but, it, but it's an important one. And so we're going to be cutting ribbons and we're going to be, and, and that's thanks to Sasha Palmer. Where is the mountaintop? The mountaintop <laughs> bistro. You, you, we have seven sisters over. You choose the mountaintop you want. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. so I just think it's uh, not to belabor the point, but I think it's worth mentioning that that the food service director, um, Ms. Palmer, has taken a high interest in working at Summit, looking at the students with the kitchen, and I know she, I know you said this, yeah, but I yeah. want to emphasize the point because she's not here. That um, it's not just like a check on a checklist. Yeah, I've checked in and making sure Summit gets students get food and they're closer to the high school cafeteria. It's been really about the students being involved in that process and that's above and beyond. So I just want to note that. No, no and, and, yeah. and thank you for saying that. S Sasha Palmer um, has been over to our place maybe a handful of times. Really, she was here t today and she was here yesterday and she was here last week. And they're really, we're reconfiguring and they're really absolutely committed and one of the things when we were over in south amherst that was a major issue was food and i think you guys know that and um it's kind of like a full circle and sasha's totally in invested and it's it's important so that kind of investment the kids see it right and so um and, it, and it's really really nice the, the other thing that we did have is we had jessica minahan in uh, i think it was almost like the first week of school and actually it was it was incredible you'd think oh gosh you know, we got all these things going on, and we're having this consultant come in, and, and um, it actually slowed us all down. It kind of got our feet kind of grounded to s start focusing in right in on the kids and trying to support them. And so that actually was, a, was something that was really uh, a great piece, so we were pleased with that. Um, so, you know, just the quick educational update. I mean, it's been f phenomenal for the kids that used to have to get on a bus to go here to take a class and then sometimes get on a bus and come back, they're just walking out the door to their classes. Um, and I think that it's created a, a, a connection that we're gonna be able to utilize along the way for kids coming to us, which we, we talked about before, that maybe this will be an easier way for students to come to us and an easier way for students to make that transition back. Or, and, and so that, that's been really nice. Um, the other thing that you know we, we had talked about in second semester is adding an eighth grade onto the, the program. And so I think we're gonna be in that place where we can really identify the needs of the district and expand our programming. And so, um, so we're looking forward to that. It's a challenge, but we're also looking forward to it because I, what we've actually, uh, we've taken on and we've talked about this, three tuition in kids, which has a, which has an impact, monetary impact, but also supports the neighboring towns to, to, to have a choice. Um, you know, that, that's not what we're here for exactly, but it, it offers an expansion and, and, and uh, that's been great. So um, that's been really a, a plus so far. Um, you know, ongoing, we're finishing up. We've got some things to think about. We've got some trips to, uh, to go on. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're, believe it or not, our, our numbers have risen, right? So we're, we're getting to that 30, that 30 student kind of, it's not a hard cap, but it's a place where we want to, we would reassess and look at what's going on. But that's where we wanted to go. That was the trajectory of what we're doing. This couldn't have happened without the support of everybody, including you guys. And, and I, it, you know, it, it just has to be said that I'm really proud of, of the staff and the students. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm really pleased that, you know, when I come into work every day, there's, there's possibilities that, are, that, are, that you can see that maybe we're not as much over at the other place. Just using that track, using the fields, having those opportunities, I think we're gonna be able to, to really uh, utilize them. And, um, you know, right now, we are in transition. So, you know, I want everybody to know that we're in transition, but the, to me, the sky is the limit. And so, I, you, know, you know, so we're pleased. But um, any questions, anybody? Ms. Rita? What are the admission standards for entry to the Summit Academy? What do so, you have to do to sure. get in? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we're a public day school. 
So there's no there's no real admission standards, although it's we're like a small you know private school where everybody that comes to us has an IEP. So, I mean those those you, you have to have needs. So okay. so it's a it's a public day school, and you we I guess the mission standards are the do we can we meet their needs? Can we meet student need? And so um, we'll have a team meeting. The team will meet and we'll say hey yeah we can meet we can meet your needs we have the ther therapeutic supports we have the academic um, capabilities of, of either uh, creating access for students or, or accommodating for students and that's that's kind of how it how it happens is that easier? yeah and then a very practical question sure. is there staff and faculty parking yeah thank you yes there is there's actually uh, there's plenty and so uh, Again, uh, you know, uh, the, the high school has really set us up for, we have a student entrance, we have a, we have a, a, main, a main office entrance, and we have about 20 spots for, for parking, which works out perfectly. So uh, how is it, I guess I'd ask, what's the process been um, for uh, engaging with families, uh, you know, parents and guardians, or students on an ongoing basis to sort of understand how they're dealing with the the transition and then that's sort of one question is how are you knowing what's going on and engaging and responding and then the second question is how just how is that going is it a mixed bag or is there is it you know i don't know what the so, so, you know, um so to answer the first question so we're, we're a small school right so we get this this great ability to kind of meet and connect with our, our parents on an ongoing basis. And so there were three or four parents and students who were really troubled at the beginning. So they came in and they kept coming in and we, we kept listening and, and in the sense of saying, okay. And there were some really clear, hey, we need to have this change. And, and actually it was helpful to all of us. And so, um, so, so the doors are always open kind of thing. And then also kind of just being really straightforward with people, I think is really helpful, you know, in the sense of this is where we're at and this is where we want to get to. And so the, the people that were really feeling it the most, we talked to the most, that, that's my feeling. And so, so there's, um, so we had meetings, we brought people in um, and, uh, and, and next week we're gonna have our open house. So we, we, we kind of are the last open house and we did that on purpose. Mm -hmm because we wanted to be able to kind of get through this transitional place um, and be able to kind of meet with people give, ha having given, you know, a couple months into it. And so Thursday is a really a big, big night for us, right? But, but again, to reiterate, um, being a small school gives us the advantage of, of really kind of meeting with our parents where they're at. But I mean, and, um Honestly, you'd have to have had the relationships with the parents to begin with in order for that to work, right? Um, so the, the, it's what the good thing from what you're saying is that, that the good thing about it is is that instead of having a relationship with the families of the parents that they're concerned about what's happening and they want to close off or they feel alienated, if they kept coming back to you, it meant they felt like they, they could or were welcome to do so even if the feedback they're giving wasn't always positive, which is a good thing. Yeah, no, I, I was really pleased. I, I, I got to tell you, I was really pleased because some people were really upset. Yeah. And so it was nice to, to, to cash in those assets in the sense of what you're talking about, of really putting in time, and they knew it, and I knew they were putting in time, and, and that makes life easier when things get more challenging. And I, I appreciate you saying that yeah. because that is what happened. Yeah, good. Other other questions or comments? Yeah, it's okay. I just want to. So, so the thing I want to acknowledge um, is that everything you heard from Principal Slovin tonight, right, was was about his leadership, right, and it was about listening to families. Because I heard from him, hey, families are concerned about X, you know, is how we're thinking. And and I know Dr. Brady and Mr. Jackson, and everyone else heard about that as well. And and sometimes that was advocacy. Sometimes it was like, hey, Mike Doreen, this needs to happen. And you know, some of that Labor Day piece that you you know was referenced was around things that were really getting in the way of students, you know, being, feeling welcomed in school, not on a human level, like person to person, but around, you know, some of the spaces that still needed some work and what the implications of morale and how students felt. So I really want to appreciate 
the advocacy you did and also the process you set up in listening to families and working with the men's students as well. So I, I just want to acknowledge that, that you had a huge amount of, to do with the success and of this transition. I, I'm not just trying to throw it back and forth here, but, 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 but the truth is that Dr. Moore's door is open and it's not like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. We did this. Or we did, no, no. Every single time we have a conversation and, it, and I feel like uh, he's not just listening to me, he's listening to the students. And so that's really important. You can't do the work with, unless you have that kind of peace because there are times I'm like, uh, we, we need this or we need that. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I'm pushing it or if I'm not. And, 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 and it's reality and, and he gets it done. So I, I appreciate that. I do. Thank you. So, yes. Um, I, I think it was a year or two years ago, a couple of students from the mm -hmm. Summit Academy came, and, and I was here, uh, I was sitting there because I was a member of Union 26 at the time. But it was very moving to me. Like, they, I was really, really impressed with them. So I just wanted to wish them all the best at this transition. And will we get a chance to hear later in the year an update on how it's going and if everyone's happy? And yeah, You know, it, I, that was a, a, a watershed moment for me and uh, I think for the school committee, but for even for our school. And I'd love to be able to get, you know, if we could, if, if people are willing, you know, some students up again, you know, and, and you know, hear their experience. And, you know, th those two students that, that actually got up in front of you guys were uh, strong leaders and, and were really, uh, it was a good time for them. And so they were able to really do a, 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 a great job. And so, but I would love to get an opportunity to, have stu you guys, you know, have students say their piece too. You know what I'd love to do is, um, and, and, it, and you, it's a work in progress, so um, the funny thing is I'd love to wait a couple of months till it's further down the road. Um, and, and I'm hoping that just means more success, but it'll mean whatever it means in terms of the experience of the students and what and your staff and everyone and, and, and Principal Jackson High School, you know, what, what what does this all look like in two months? And what additional learning is there from it? What should the committee know? How can we be additionally supportive of everyone involved? Um, so if, if we could, and if that makes sense to both of you, we could do that, like put it on the calendar for the beginning of the year or something, either end of this of all or the beginning of the year. I think, I, I think that would be great. I, th I, I really appreciate being able to give you guys the transition. I know you guys are interested yeah. in it. And, um, you know, that being said, we are a public day school, and we're, we're dealing with lots of students with, with incredible, sometimes challenges, and sometimes just great things that are going on. Like, we have such talented kids at our school. I mean, not, you know, in the arts, academically, and I want to really be able to showcase that and, and be able to work through whatever's going on for them or their families. And, and just and have that balance. Yeah, right? you don't have so to come have back. That no, 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 no. You don't have to come back with problems. <laughs> no, no. I mean, if you want to come back with no, nothing no, but no, success, no, that's no, great. I love the I, <laughs> I love the notion of, of 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 having that being played out on both hands. Yeah. You know, being able to realize that we have incredible talent and also we have challenges, and and and, and sit here in front of you guys and give you both. Yeah, great, right. Serena. To the extent it's appropriate, I for one would love to hear some of the problems you face. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can imagine them, but having them described would be helpful. So you, what do you mean? In the, in well, what, what, what are some of the problems that you have in running the academy? It's it's a really good question. Not I now, mean, there, not yeah, now. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, at some point that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, no, absolutely. Could I close on just one absolutely positive note? Uh, That's is another that, positive note. We've yeah, many positive notes. There were, uh, but a positive note particularly of what Ms. Cassinson said. So uh, I thought the students were great. I agree with that comment. But the interesting thing was when I would go back and talk to students at Summit, the impact it had on the school, that their students were invited and were able to present the experience that they had. Uh, being that it's a small school, being that you know, all the things that Mr. Principal Slovin just mentioned, it, it was amazing the, the impact it had on the school and what students were able to tell me and their level of pride and feeling like, you know, they're part of things. Because I think anytime you're in a specialized program of any sort, right, there's a natural inclination to not feel like you're on the same, same plane as the bulk of the organization. Just numerically, there's all sorts of reasons why. And, and, and students who weren't at that night 
spoke about the impact that they, they had two student council reps who then went to the, the biggest stage, in their opinion, of the district, which I think is true, it is, and, and present their piece. So I, I would love to think about that again, but I wanted you all to hear, because I don't know if we ever loop back to that in this way, the impact it had on the school, not just the two students who came and on the committee. And just a, just a <coughs> note, so I still connect with those particular students, um, and they're both in college, so they're doing well. Yeah. Awesome, they were great. They were great. Uh, we'll thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And we'll, thank now you, we're set up for another one. This yes, is great. Because yeah, like, no, yeah. when you were here in June, yeah. we set up this one. Now you're here, we're setting up another one. Yeah. Sounds good. It's never going to end, dude. You. You're going to keep being coming back. I, I love it. You know, I can see myself on TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so far we've had a lot of upbeat discussions. I mean, really engaged and upbeat. So I'm assuming budget regional assessment <laughs> discussion is on the agenda because it's simple, similarly mirthful, upbeat, and positive conversation. Let's wait for everybody to leave. you're you're on the hook for this one. Well, that, that's a hard intro for Shimangano, huh? Uh, yeah, I don't. Do you have a flash or something? Uh, can you, is that your account? Yeah. Can you put this? I have to the um, Google Doc. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so assessment methods are always tough after nine o'clock. So are you bear going with me. through? Are you going through methods? No, but even the topic is a tough topic at this time. Uh, so I'll try to make it brief. Luckily, most of most Same. of it, most of us have been there one way or the other. Either we're on the committee. Gotcha. Right, yeah. We got two new members that probably need. So most of tonight's presentation will be sort of context and leading to sure. the decision or the the discussion that you have to have. Um, and then you can either have it tonight or maybe that could be the next time we come back to talk about this topic. This yep, perfect. Snazzy template there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is. It's different than usual. It's just, yeah, oh. it is. It's the Google standard. Yes, again. Um, so, again, this is more sort of just factual to provide the um, context for this topic. Um, so a regional school district uh, has to choose an assessment method every year, and it has two options that it can choose from. One is the statutory method, and one is the alternative method. I'm really sorry, but, you know, 9 o'clock, but I'm going to keep going. Um, <laughs> so, so statutory method, right? What is that? Um, so that is the method that the state created a long time ago and has made updates to along the way um, that basically factors in town income, uh, property values and a few other factors um, to calculate something that's called a minimum contribution and that basically says of all the towns in your region here's how much each town has to uh, basically be assessed at a minimum and then if your assessment goes beyond that which most regional school districts do um, the assessment that goes beyond that minimum is assessed based on your regional agreement and so in our case our regional agreement is a five-year rolling average of enrollment but not that's just us specifically that could be different in other regions this method requires approval by the regional school committee, a majority, and requires approval by three out of the four um, member towns. So in the past, it was three out of four town meetings. We think it's going to be three out of four town meetings slash city councils. But have we, have we got con confirmation on that? Not yet. So because we changed the form of government, I think we're unique in the state um, of being a region that has a city and three towns. What would be the alternative? I don't know. Um, popular, <laughs> popular vote. Okay. Whoa. Okay, let's. Yes. <laughs> I'm talking about like sharing information with people, right? No, no, no. I was gonna, I was gonna table that one until you got back from the attorneys. But go ahead, Mr. Right, so there are regions without town meetings, like Bridgewater, Raynham. Uh, I think are those two cities. Uh, Bridgewater is Raynham. I think I think Raynham is the. I might be getting my singles crossed, but that one of them. I think it's Bridgewater that is switched to um, mayor council. It may be. I, I haven't seen it, but it may, might be. The question's been brought to two the council for the town of Amherst and we'll probably we find a solution that doesn't involve having a I plebiscite every time. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah. Any questions? See, that it? wakes you up, yeah. right? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any question on what the statutory method is or how, I mean, generally how it works and what it factors in? So the other option is the alternative method and this method allocates 100% of the assessment based on whatever formula exists in the regional agreement. And so again, ours is a five-year-old average of enrollment, but in any given year, you can amend your regional agreement 
to whatever you can get the towns to agree to or the, the committee to agree to. Um, we've had to do that the last few years. And this method requires approval by the regional school committee majority, but the, the different piece here is that you need all towns in the region uh, to approve this method at town meeting or city council. Um, so you need it unanimous, whereas the statutory method is three out of four. And that's sort of been the, the issue you'll, you'll see in a little bit. So history, uh, from 2000 to 2004, the region used the statutory method. From 2005 to 2007, we used an alternative method that was amended every year to have, like one year was equal increases, so all the town's assessments went up the same amount, um, and they really went year to year and had different things each year. In 2008 to 2016, the region started using the regional agreement method, or the, the alternative method, and using the five-year rolling average of enrollment every year. And then in 2017 to 19, we've kind of gone back to that limbo phase where we've used modified methods. So we're technically using the alternative method, but it's not the five-year rolling average of enrollment. It's modified to include that and other stuff. Um, so in FY17, what is that other stuff? So in FY17, the assessment was based on 10% taxable property values and 90% our regional agreement um, or five-year rolling average of enrollment. So that was basically to acknowledge that we weren't factoring in a town's wealth in the past when we were doing it strictly by enrollment. And so by making 10% of the assessment based on taxable property values, it was phasing in a little bit of a town's wealth into the, into the formula. In FY18, we did sort of the same thing, just a slightly different measure of a town's wealth. Um, we did 10% of the minimum contribution and 90% of the regional agreement. And then in FY19, we upped that to 20% of the minimum contribution and 80% of the regional agreement. And the minimum contribution is some factor of property values? And town income and a few other things, yeah. But primarily um, property values and town income. So context for why we're here. So uh, in 2014-15-ish, is it that year or the next year, somewhere around then, um, some officials from Shootsbury expressed concern about the regional agreement method, the one that, one that assessed towns purely based on enrollment, um, and said that they had trouble supporting it because it didn't factor in a town's wealth. Um, and really, the, the data would show that they paid more every year for quite a bit of time under that method than they would under the state's method. Um, and over time, that added up to quite a bit of mo uh, a large amount of money. Um, so in response to that, the region has hosted multiple working groups, uh, really three of them for each of the last three years. Um, to try to find a long-term solution. We've only been successful at finding short-term solutions, um, which has avoided you know, big budget issues, but it's got us, every year we're back in the same place of how do we find a long-term solution. Um, there's an FY19 working group. This is the one that we elected to get outside consulting support um, from Mark Abrams, who's also working with our regionalization group now. Um, that wasn't successful. He made a recommendation that wasn't um, agreed to by all four towns. FY18 was sort of an internal working group, same thing with FY17, both those years we came up with modified methods. And there was even a working group in FY08 before I was here that kind of did the same thing. They moved this back to the regional agreement method. They All four towns supported that at the time. And so the path forward, um, this committee and, and all of us have um, some options, what we want to do for the FY20 budget and beyond. Um, so we could continue phasing in the statutory method. That was sort of the path we started on last year. We moved to 20%. Um, and we could keep moving that incrementally towards full implementation of the statutory method. So the next logical would probably be 40% or maybe 30%. Um, the second option is we could stay where we are at 20%. Um, the benefit of that is, you know, it doesn't, our, our, the budget impact won't be imp uh, affected by the assessment changing. Um, every year when we change the assessment method, there's an either a positive impact or a negative impact just from the assessment itself uh, or the assessment method itself. Um, or three, we could propose a different method and see if we can get four towns to agree to it. And there's probably other options, but those are the sort of the three to discuss. Questions? Ms. Pitcher? So um, it sounds like this assessment has more to do with the share of whatever the total budget is that each town contributes to. Sort of two. So, and, and so I'm trying to figure out the relationship between you know, th there's the size of the total pie and then the share of that pie that each um, town is responsible for. Yeah. I'm assuming they're related. Yeah, and, so and I'm just trying to understand a little bit more about how. Yeah, so when the new. issue first popped up, it was more about the share, um, not the total. I think all four towns were in a position where they really understood how robust and comprehensive the region is and all the um, educational opportunities it provides to the students. And it was more about how should we 
split that cost. I think in recent, the last couple times, the what's sort of new is some towns have questioned, is the level of funding for the schools the right level of funding? Um, sort of bringing in that total piece to the equation. So I think right now we're in a place where it's both, um, okay. the total and how it's shared, um, with some towns focusing more on one than the other. It was confusing for me to follow who said what and how the final de decision was made for this year's assessment. Who agreed to what? what was it the <coughs> town? Was it a committee? Or? So it's very difficult. Um, <laughs> so basically we present options. Um, we try to provide as much time as possible for feedback on those options. And sometimes we hope that there's natural sort of agreement. Um, one rises to the top and that it's an obvious one that works for everybody. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, last year, I think it was sort of like, what's the least bad option that everyone sort of agreed to? Um, you know, there Who wasn't was this everybody? So it's, do you want to speak? Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. You, you can, but I was, I was going to say there's context here. So what, it, it, at the end of December or January, we get the, the, all the boards together? Or De both? December. December. December, and then last year we did December and January. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and basically what you do is you get the political, whatever this should be in a perfect world, the reality <laughs> is this is a political decision that involves the major political stakeholders that we have within the four towns. And so that means you have um, the various select boards, um, you have the various finance committees, uh, and then you have the members of the school committee um, who all have a significant role in whether within their communities Oh, and then obviously of the town staffs um, who are involved and who are making assessments around what they think um, reasonable the towns can afford, right? And what the tax rates are going to be and all that kind of stuff. And so um, the, ch the challenge is to get agreement amongst that range of stakeholders, all of whom actually have a role in the process, right? So, if, I mean, I don't know, however the town council is going to work. So I'm setting aside the question of what's going to happen in Amherst um, in the future. Is you have, as you know, you have finance committees that develop and recommend budgets and <coughs> hold some sway in their communities. You have select boards that also then vote and approve uh, recommendations and budgets and hold some sway. And then you have the school committee with whatever influence it has and we have. And so the reality is you've got, in, in, if things aren't contentious, then you have discussions and present interesting information and everyone nods their head. Um, in a contentious situation, the reality is you've got to get some combination of these actors over a period of time to be willing to either, ideally we wanted to be happy, which is the point of that outside consultant in the working group last year, is to get happy about a common method and get a common agreement around the variables. The, the reality is though, there are a lot of really complex variables involved. So people want there's many people, and even sort of philosophically people would agree, that in some weight or factor around the wealth of a town or a community, or income in a community, because income and wealth are the same thing, um, should be factored in. But then there are other folks who then started arguing this past year that uh, Amherst had an unnaturally low, they would call it an unnaturally low, um, median household income because of the inclusion of students in census-related data and state-related income data. And so they would then say, well, I like the factor conceptually, but I don't like the data source we're using um, because we think it's skewed and skewed to the favor of the town. And I bring that up only because, you know, yeah, and there's even a case to be made for that too. Mm -hmm. But my point is that's how, these, that's how you go down this rabbit hole of a combination of people's genuine and perceived experiences, how that relates to the factors they think they can involve, and then the, the bottom line is, for some, for some people, once you put all of that through this sort of Rube Goldberg mechanism, if they don't like the final number they see at the end, then, then essentially they'll work backwards to why they hate the methodology because in the end the number doesn't work anyway, right? I'm trying to sound unduly that's negative. True, true. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but also, I, I'm, do, I'm, I'm kind of being negative in that regard only because, in, again, I've only been here two years, but I've been involved now, and there's an enormous amount of work that's gone in over the years and discussions on this subject. I think, from my perspective, all of it's actually been of good faith. Even for people who disagree really strongly about what to do, people have brought who they are to the table and what they believe are the issues. The, the, to me, and I'm being very blunt, I know this is on camera, the scariest thing for me this past year was when we moved beyond either sort of like 
underlying <laughs> antipathy that some towns have be sometimes between each other, where they don't talk well to one another, and even beyond questions of, well, what do you do about income then, household income in Amherst, if it feels like it's unnaturally depressed? And you got into questions of, well, what are step increases and why do we have them? And, you know, if what, what, how do you build what your base budget is that you're accreting on each year, and is it even the right one? And I'm, I know I'm saying this publicly, but I'm going to say it, that, that philosophically, we know we have, and I'm overly simplifying, but we know we have school districts in this state that essentially look at what the foundation budget is that the state would say they should have, and any percentage they are over the foundation budget represents their amazing dedication to education. But what that means as a practical matter is cutting lots of things and lots of programs. Because you can be over the foundation budget in this state and still actually have to cut a lot of electives and a lot of other services that you might otherwise want to provide. Our town hasn't really done that in Amherst. Our region hasn't done that among all four towns. We've tended to compose the budget and services that we, that we genuinely think creates the best educational and supportive whole child environment for our students and our families, and then no, we can't really afford it. <laughs> so then we, we work down from what we really want. Last year, a philosophical argument broke out over whether we want to actually be a fundamentally different kind of school district. That's a really bad place for us to go. Uh, it doesn't lead to a good place. Um, because anyone can look at the data between Pelham, Amherst, Leverett, and, and Shutesbury and say there are differences in income, there are differences in property values, there's difference in businesses, whatever. You know what I mean? You can have a rational argument over the capacity and ability to pay between different communities, and it's based on reality, whatever we want to do. If you start arguing over who you even want to be, um, that doesn't lead to a good place, in my view. Um, and, but I mean, I know that within the communities themselves, there are arguments and discussions breaking out over this very question. Sorry. No, no. That was, I mean, by the way, I was just, I was trying to, I mean, it's one thing to talk about the methodologies and how do we come to agreement, but I wanted to bring this back to reality in sort of like a cold bath of where, where we're actually going to go for the next couple months. And if I'm wrong and the conversation isn't that and people come into the room saying, all right, let's look at the alternative method we adopted. What variation of compromise shall we come up with? Awesome. That'll be, I mean, even if we like the numbers or don't like the numbers, it'll be a great place to be. I just wanted you to be prepared for the possibility that you go into a four towns meeting in December, or even before them when you're talking to your neighbors, and, and we're actually in a much different place and it's a much harsher place. Sorry. Mike. No, no, that, that's exactly. So taking a step back, and then I'll go forward, the reason we're talking about this in October, which is atypical, we don't, uh, in my recollection we have not talked about assessment methodology in October, is to have this kind of conversation. That, that We wouldn't be talking about October if we didn't have significant levels of concerns about how to build consensus to move forward with, it, with the district that we all want to have and with Fort Towns willing to support. So I apologize, I should have sort of framed that out at the beginning of the conversation as to the purpose. Um, I think the chair did an excellent job describing of you know the recent history on the political side and, and one of the things that I think we're looking for guidance from the committee on, part of this gets complicated with the change of government of one of our towns. I mean, logistically complicated, that's not a political statement of good, bad, whatever, it's just there's gonna be a transition is how to start engaging that conversation. Uh, we've, you know, as, as Mr. Mangano said, we've had consultants in, we've had working groups. You know, at the end of last year's working group, um, it did feel like there wasn't a desire for another working group, like we got as far as working groups are going to get. So I think it becomes a political question, as, as the chair mentioned, of you know, how do we approach this in, in a way that's inclusive um, and has conversations early? Because we don't want to get to February, March, with the level of uncertainty that I think the district, the staff, are very concerned about um, having, knowing that one of our towns is changing government in November and December, and how does that complicate it? So I think that's what, and we don't need to resolve this. You know, when the chair talked, we we're going to come back to this in November, again, a little earlier than we typically would talk about system methodologies, but, you know, the thing that I think we need to think about, certainly, and, and make some decisions about in November, 
is what's our strategy moving forward? And, you know, we can, you know, on staff, we can come up with whatever methods people want us to come up with. Mr. Mangana is wonderful, wonderfully fantastic about and creative about that, but, but it's, it's not so much about, for, for me, I'll speak for myself, about what method are we going to use. It's actually how are we going to engage the larger political question of how to, how to approach four towns and both, to, to, to Ms. Spitzer's point, both the share and then the, the sum total. Because um, I think that last year, we came up with a solution that mitigated sort of our worst case scenario, but um, I think I know that different towns, because have contacted me, le came away with that with different expectations of the current year. Some towns, as Mr. Mangano said, oh, we're going forward with a 20% increase, so it'd be 40% this year. Other towns uh, agreed to last year without the additional caveat leading into this year. So, so the, the goal for us is how do we engage the towns early um, and often in an inclusive way so we can we can functionally get things moving in a way that supports our students. Let me put a finer point on that Please. too, is that um, unless it's changed, so correct me if it's changed, yeah. but my recollection, my clear recollection is that there was one town, for example, that said, I want to go to the statutory method as soon as humanly possible, yeah. ideally next year or immediately. There was another town, I guess we're not naming the towns, right, because we're all being really cool and polite about this. <laughs> I think that's how it goes, the town that that shall not be named, I right? I'd be, I'd be, I'd be hey, cool that was with, a real I'd thing. I'd be cool with naming yeah, yeah. personally. At town meetings, but that's any, how anyways, there's, an, there's another town <laughs> that we might be sitting in right now um, that didn't actually agree to move to the statutory method at all yeah. and said, I'll do, I'll do this as a one-year compromise just because we need to make sure there's a budget in place, but we're not doing it longer term. So uh, my point is there's, there's not only not agreement, there, there was a clear statement of like polar disagreement yeah. on that. Sorry, still on. Um, Sean, could you explain? Um, I have this thought in my head that it's uh, we were working on the assumption last year that it would be bad to go immediately to full statutory. Could you explain why, if that's true, and if so, why? And also, what happens if only two towns agree? What if we don't get to three or four? Well, like, if, you, if you don't get to so if you're under the statutory method and you don't get to three, then you don't have a budget. So we have to keep working. Um, okay. until we get an agreement by three. Um, if you don't get that by the start of the fiscal year, then you move to like a one twelfth type situation okay. um, where the state would only give you one twelfth of your state aid and you'd have to work out one twelfth assessments and things like that. That, that sounds also bad. Don't want to be in that spot. Right. Sure. Um, <laughs> and cash flow becomes a real issue. Right. Um, so that's bad. Um, so the reason why statutory, going straight to statutory was a big deal is because so right now, uh, and this is one of the bigger problems too, is Amherst is sort of structurally different from the other three towns. Amherst provides lots of services, has the college, you know, robust fire departments, and, and that's one of the issues that's been brought up is that they're just a, you know, they're not equal in terms of what they do anymore. So it's hard to compare them uh, as towns. And so right now the statutory method would shift a huge amount of the assessment all to Amherst all at once, um, and and that would either Amherst would absorb that or they couldn't, and then the region would have to cut that cost uh, to a level that they could absorb. Um, so that's the main reason why the statutory method was um, going to it all at once definitely wasn't going to work is because it would shift, I think it was eight hundred, six hundred, or eight hundred thousand dollars something like that all at once to, to the town of Amherst. Dr. Morris and Mr. Mangano. Yeah, so just to add to Mr. Mangano, I think that's one of the other challenges with having, uh, mathematical challenges, with having towns of significantly different size. Um, so if, if we're lining up shares, the impact will be oversized because, um, and I'm not suggesting it's, it's a harder a hardship on Amherst, but just mathematically from the district point of view, I'm not talking about political fairness or anything, you know, uh, a, a small difference uh, monetarily for the district from one town because it's a share piece and it's all relational can cause a huge difference for the district. And I think because Amherst has such a significant share of the cost um, that sort of plays into the what Mr. Mangano said. Can I just saying. clarify that real quick? So, yeah. for example, if we wanted to reduce Shootsbury's assessment by $10,000, if we use the formula to do that, then we actually have to reduce the budget by $100,000 because Shootsbury is roughly 10% of the total. And so we have to reduce the total by 100000 just to get Shootsbury to where it might need to be. And that's just an example. Shootsbury's not asking for that. Um, but that's why the, the differences make, a, make it harder. Serena? I agree with you that this is a two-part process, the assessment process and what we want the schools to be. In terms of what we want the school to be, when will be the first time we get the proposed budget to consider? So in terms of a real detailed-looking budget, um, our, moderate, our normal budget that we present would be January. 
um, is when we present the budget with roughly what we're thinking for cuts and ads, and that's usually based on feedback we get from the four towns at the first four town meeting in terms of what their assessments can look like for the following year. Um, so if that process is the same, it'll be January. Um, we have budget projections prior to that where we can just have projections and talk about what that means for the assessment. But in terms of a more detailed budget, it'd be January. So this is to be continued. Yeah. Anything else you guys wanted out of this? Good. Can I just Any ask, questions? is there any documentation <coughs> that we could review for those of us who are new, like any? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Reports that I can send run. you lots of PowerPoints and reports. Yeah, I mean, and I, I would actually just um, appreciate a little bit of that as somebody who just the history would be interesting. Is there anybody else who wants that? Can I make a just okay. process suggestion yeah. if you can make a Google folder sure. that has yeah. all the presentations in it, and then yeah. should Debbie, Debbie could send the link to the full committee so everyone because even if you've been a been on the committee for a while, just having a review of that, I think everyone having the same information is helpful. I think it's good. I mean, if you could, okay. I th my recollection is the presentations we went through last year from December onward did a pretty good job of yeah. walking through some of the history, but also what these methods were, how they're derived, mm -hmm. how changes in those methods have diff different impacts on the towns, yeah. right? Yep, you can do that. I'm just saying I front load yeah. some of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Could you also include the date that the conversation in here was videotaped on that same thing? Because the discussion amplified the report. You know, like was it a, was it a February meeting when the one was finally oh. pre presented to us? So you could, and I assume that those were all archived on the uh, Amos Media website. Yeah, that's true. I mean, somebody certainly, if you had questions, it would be a guided conversation essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Cool, so we'll move on? Thank you. We'll move on. Thank you. Thanks, right Sean. Thanks, Sean. You know, I keep bringing her to gavel. <laughs> you do. It looks like something's going to happen. <laughs> the gaveling. Itchy gavel thing. Um, superintendent goals. Yeah. So the draft goals are on the back page of the packet. Mm -hmm. um, easy to find. So I thought I'd just go through the draft and the uh, thinking behind it and take feedback and see where the conversation leads. Yes. Okay. So the first one is to provide <coughs> social justice professional development with a focus on historically marginalized groups for all staff members and provide an intensive focus on racial equity training for administrators. Um, and I, the references that are made, uh, we didn't print all like 45 pages of the superintendent rubric, but it links to uh, multiple ones because it's an evaluative document and should be connecting to the, um, to the <coughs> superintendent evaluation rubric. And again, the focus on this sort of was addressed earlier in the evening was that it's one thing to have the right values and core principles, another thing to make sure that all staff are included in training, and that includes paraeducators, bus drivers, professional staff, administrative staff. And, um, and the focus on historically marginalized groups is pretty, I just want to be super clear, that's very inclusive. So certainly race, ethnicity is part of that. Um, but there's many other, you know, like I know some of the PD we're planning includes, you know, there's just because Ms. Cunningham and I were going over today, uh, LGBTQ, um, gender orientation, what to do with when challenging student conversations come up. So some of it's around um, being proactive <coughs> and some of it's being responsive because that's the nature of working in schools. So. Uh, I guess I'll go through these and then open them up for questions. Yeah, yeah, please. Good. The second one is a sustained multi-year goal to increase the diversity of teaching staff by ensuring that new hires of the district represent a higher percentage of persons of color than the current staffing percentages. Um, I think it's it's a way to continually both um, track our hires and also continually raise the bar. So that's what we've done the last two years. Our hires have been, and you'll hear about this from Ms. Cunningham next month, uh, but our hires have been more diverse racially, ethnically than our current staff. And so as that continues to be our goal, the, the, the nice way about it is it's, we don't hire, I mean, one of the things, hard things about putting a percentage on it, I'll just say here, is um, we don't know how many staff are hiring year to year. And so we're not an organization that turns over like 30% of its staff. And like, I think if we were, then we could make quicker progress on this. And that would also be really negative in terms of our staff. We have really incredible, incredibly valuable staff. We want them staying as long as they want to be in the district. So uh, the idea is that we're continually tracking and that, that bar continually goes up. Um, and we set the expectation that every year it's above the, the current level and then the next year it continues. So we feel like it's a sustainable mo model um, around increasing diversity. The third 
Uh, one was include methods that include broad participation of stakeholders throughout the process, using methods, excuse me, develop multi-year school and district improvement programs. Um, so this is really um, the strategic planning process that you've heard about and will continue to hear about. The fourth goal is present a capital plan to address the significant infrastructure issues in our aging school buildings, including issues, mechanical systems, access, and you heard tonight about exterior spaces. Um, and the second part, which you also heard about tonight, it's kind of, this is the way it should be, right? Goals are connected to things that are routinely updated at school committee. I didn't plan it that way, but happy accident. Um, complete an ADA audit of the school buildings to be shared with the public to identify access issues and potential solutions. This was an uh, agenda topic last, last meeting. The fifth one, something that was in the capital planning for this year, successfully complete a building use master planning process to develop multiple options for consideration, understanding the costs and implications of each option. Thank you to Ms. Cassins, and I know she's agreed to be on the uh, review team for the proposals that came in. Um, certainly a lot of community interest in this. I get lots and lots of questions from this quite frequently, uh, both from <coughs> elementary and secondary parents because of the possible implications for sixth grade. And the last one is to develop goals and objectives to advance the district work on student wellness. I'll be explicit that it, this is the vaguest goal on the list. Um, and, you know, for instance, you know, Mr. Jackson and, and Mr. Sheehan were at a conference today thinking about wellness in a particular, you know, having a particular angle, which is, you know, learning the evidence about school start times and considering that. That's not to suggest that we're heading down that way, but I think the hard time with defining wellness is that we're starting the introductory phases to thinking about this more comprehensively. Mm -hmm. So for me to put school start times is way presumptuous on a goal sheet. Um, but what is what I think is being very intentionally focused on is how do we think about wellness of students, right? So we think of Jessica Manahan, some of that evidence around student anxiety, what we're hearing from our mental health teams, and to develop goals and objectives that we can continue in future work. So, you know, while this is could be seen as connected to strategic planning, I think it's a bit more focused than that because it's it's an issue that we know is we know is a problem. Our students tell us that, our counselors tell us that, our families tell us that. And we don't have an articulated vision for how to address that. So it's, it's you know, more than action steps are like, oh, we're doing this next year. It's like, how do we think about student wellness and more holistically than perhaps we've focused on it prior. So um, I understand, and, and I'm open to any critique on any of these, but particularly that one perhaps in the, the vagueness, but I wanted to explain the intentionality is that how do we approach this task? How do we think about this task? So we could isolate any number of things, start time, uh, mental health needs of students, homework load, um, what time athletic games start, right? Th there's a whole swath of things that we can think about. And right now, we're, I think, in this place of looking at them as isolated um, issues. And we want to take a much more holistic view on how do we think about the wellness challenges that is our students are facing in 2018. Think of digital media and these things and the implications for students, which there's some um, some evidence about what these things do to, I mean, not just children, but we could talk about all of us and how quickly you all email me and I email back and we go back and forth and that's its own thing. But particularly when we think about the adolescent brain. Um, so that's, we want to have a holistic approach. Uh, I want to sound like a broken record and we want to be thoughtful about how we're approaching the task of thinking about our students and the whole child. So that's, I'm open to any feedback, but this is um, based on the feedback that I received last time when um, I appreciated getting that when we went around the room. Uh, this is what I developed, and um, certainly I'm open to feedback, and people want to do that, and we can come back and vote next time, you know, whatever uh, works for the committee. I, I think two, I mean, I, I think two things. I think one, since if we're not going to meet till November 20th yeah. again, um, I think whether or not we vote tonight, and I'm open to whether we vote tonight, people want to, um, we'd have to get a clear sentiment from the committee with this looks like I'm yes. on the right track. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> the idea that we'd be voting on six weeks from now, yeah. you know, almost halfway through the year, be like, oh, no, no, I don't like three of them. That's, like, <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's really, um, pre you know, as a procedural matter, if we want to vote or not, it's up. To the sentiment of the table based on how you think the, they are. On, 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 I know this is going to sound stupid, but I'm an utter broken record. On wellness, would you include things like looking at uh, eating disorders, substances, um, where we are as one of the handful of states in this country that have legalized recreational marijuana, and it's out 
even though it's illegal for kids and they're not supposed to have it, it's still out there? I mean, does it include, you mentioned other things that are more sort of academically and building oriented. Does it include how the school engages with the wellness of students otherwise? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I picked on some, some low-hanging fruit, but um, certainly um, substance abuse is, is, it's a high school and a middle school. and, mm -hmm. and what the national data and local data tells us from things like the Spiffy Report, which is Western Mass centric um, evidence, is that there's an increasing use of um, illegal substances at younger ages. You know, so that's the trend. The trend isn't necessarily like wild increases at the high school. I mean, they're seeing some, but what, what they're really seeing is the middle schools across the region are seeing um, seeing things they haven't seen before about when substances are introduced. So. Absolutely, and, and we've done some work on that, but again, the, the larger vision of, I think this conversation is exactly the one we want to have. Yeah. 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 Um, why don't we go around the table again, mm -hmm. yeah. just because it's useful, and again, like last time, if you want to pass at the moment, just pass. Um, First, let me state, I wouldn't take your job for all the tea in China. <laughs> uh, 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 this is a reasonable list of goals. It's measurable in, to some extent. I could vote tonight on this favorably. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. I think, actually, I think this does a really good job synthesizing um, the committee members' suggestions last time. Um, I actually really like number six, and there's kind of like a, like a, it's like a, a, a goal of a having a goal, you know, like it's like a way for us to, to actually frame a discussion and then organically come up with more goals. So I th think that was a good, I really like it. Um, I'd be comfortable voting on these tonight. And the last thing, I mentioned this at the Pelham meeting, but in future meetings, I mean, I assume we'll have updates on progress, and maybe um, just within those updates, if we could have a sense of, like, what artifacts we could be looking for and, um, you know, how they relate to these standards, we can look at that ourselves. But sometimes I think drawing those connections is helpful. So. Um. Having missed last uh, the, our last meeting, um, uh, I still think that you know, did, um, being on the receiving end and reading these at this point, I think this is a good collection of them. Um, I am. I could be persuaded on voting tonight. Um, I, I hesitate only because this is our first read of them. Um, I mean, we saw the agenda packet earlier, of course, but. Um, but I, I want to, uh, my only hesitation is sort of thinking through the input that we received from the SCTF and if there's any tweaks that um, that we would want to make in this um, in terms of some of the specificity of some of the things. Um, and I would like, I, I do re also really like um, goal number six and I understand the rationale for being vague, but I do wonder if there's an opportunity to spell out sort of more precisely, could include some of these things. Um, just to, again, so that when we come back at the end of the year, and, and I like how you phrase that, that sort of understanding what artifacts we might be looking at or wanting to see throughout the year. Um, and, and I'm not saying spell out now what, what the changes would be, but just sort of put guardrails on, on sort of what might be included. Um, so I guess my only question is about the relationship between f four and five. And I mm -hmm. apologize for my ignorance, but um, could you just go into a little bit more detail about, because if it's already happening, the, the building use and master planning, pro so develop multiple options for consideration, meaning multiple options of what, I, I guess, or just how to use the, the space we already have. Is this related to the middle school, high school consoli potential consolidation, or is this something else? I'm just confused. Please. Yeah, so four is really about the capital needs we have having nothing to do with consolidation, right? So we have a middle school roof. We've got, we've got a significant number. Of, you, you heard about the fields. Yeah. We've got significant number of infrastructure issues. Um, and we, revolved, we had a, a log jam of projects that were not completed from capital, and we're now actually caught up. Um, so we, we had approved projects that just, for a whole host of reasons, <laughs> took longer than we wanted them to, to take. And so we now have a, a significant set of needs across our buildings that we need to tackle, you know, interior and exterior. So that was really the attempt of number four. And I know for the Amherst members, you heard about it, and it's a different thing that at the yeah. elementary level, but, but no less 
important when you heard you know some of the reports of the track and um, the safety needs that were expressed. Um, you know, and I think in terms of roofs, you know, Mr. Cody's not here tonight, but if he was looking at all of the buildings and all the districts he works in, which are all the ones I work in, um, the middle school roof and some of the infrastructure there is, is the highest priority that we have in terms of that, and it's a big ticket item, so we have to figure out what we're gonna do with that. Um, number five is really more about um, looking at the, the capital item last spring. It was focused on the master planning. So, you know, what would it take to move seventh and eighth grade to the high school? And I, I don't mean educationally, I mean practically, logistically, financially, uh, infrastructure wise. What would it look like to perhaps have sixth grade come to the middle school? And what are the implications of that? Um, these are questions that we will get asked again. We get asked routinely. At those of you who've been to go to Fort Town meetings for a while, I think Mr. Sullivan might have the take the cake for the most at the table. Um, and we need to have better answers than either we agree or we don't agree or we can't do it or we, you know, or we think we can do it. We, we need to give the communities real clear information of what are the implications. And then if the communities want us to and we agree, then we can focus on the educational realities of that piece. But um, we need much more hard data than we currently have about what options we exist um, and what are the implications both on capital and operational expenses of our, our district. So I guess my only recommendation would be is we could spell out in yeah. this one that this is related to potential consolidation of the high school and middle school, because otherwise I think we could be thinking about, you know, are we using this space in the high school appropriately, right. and, and or the middle school, not yeah. it's middle school, but it it's also including potential consolidation of the two. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I just want to thank you for continuing to consolidate and be more concise as we move as, through the evaluation process because that the first year we did it with you it was kind of it was super broad and you've been listening to us and you're working on you know you're paring them down and you're becoming more um, succinct with what you're actually trying to do and I just want to thank you for that and I'd be willing to vote on it tonight thank you very much appreciate it uh, so I, I also appreciate the work you put into it, uh, which I think is very good. And I think one of the challenges we have is that there's a, I think I said this to you offline, there's like a million things you could put into your priorities or goals or that we could collectively put into your goals. And I don't mean that sarcastically or flippantly. I right. mean, there are genuinely a lot of priorities that could be in this. There could be a completely different list that would also be worth prioritizing. And it also doesn't represent everything you're doing uh, in any way. For example, um, we're going to have, I'm sure, another tough budget year. And last year we had one of the goals being in maintaining a sound ship, good leadership, and uh, focusing on the core educational mission and trying to wait to support and preserve that. Um, and that's not on this list now. Um, that doesn't mean that isn't still a goal that's critically important for you to do. Um, and as I say that only because I think the challenge when you're voting on these sorts of things is when do you decide that this is okay and is, and is either enough or right? Um, and the reality is you can spin around on this thing forever. Uh, I think I agree on number six that it'd be great to just, it's not about what the deliverable is. I think saying student wellness, work on student wellness is probably specific enough a description of like the topic, you know, the, what's in the box. The question is, what's the box, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if by the end of the year, we'll, we'll do X or Y. Yeah. Is a, whatever you think would be reasonable to put in would be a, probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, for one and two, uh, I like them, but also I like the fact that um, they directly correspond the things that are already in the SCPF <coughs> memo that we got today. And I think that demonstrates a responsiveness to those items um, and, and forgetting the issue of like, we're already being responded, I don't mean that. Yeah. I'm just saying collaboratively, we're talking to one another, we're listening to one another, and it's, it's in there. Um, and I don't know that it needs to be in here. My view specified is my view is number three, meaning uh, using uh, broadly participatory techniques, uh, we're gonna actually make substantial progress on developing a multi-year uh, strategic plan, already incorporates everything else that was in the SETF's memo, if not in specifics about how do you work out where you're going on X and Y, numerically, do we need to know more about X and will we learn it? 
do we need to know more about why and how do we get to consensus on what a good process is to advance that, that, that objective? Um, it, I mean, um, forgive me for saying this, if in general those six items or some combination of those items, five or six of them, aren't part of a district improvement plan at the end, it's not going to be successful and it's not going to work, right? They're going to have to be echoes back to what the community is saying is important. Um, and, and my reason I'm saying that is because that's a way of, I mean, at least from my part, of acknowledging that this question of are we baking in multiple elements into the goals for the year, whether they're literally called out and said do X by May, um, to me they are. That's my sentiment anyways on it. Um, and I will punt it to my right. Um, so I, uh, as to the voting question, I guess my weak preference is that is not to vote because I've heard some tweaks to this. And I think I think we could spend a lot of time doing little micro amendments for a long time, um, as, so long as you don't feel like you're slowed down over the next six weeks. With because I, I I hear a pretty general consensus of support for the, the themes you've advanced. Um, that's just my thought on voting. Um, and a couple of specific questions. And number three, um, develop multi-year school and district improvement plans. So we have two schools, middle school and high school, and yet one of these things is, is a building use master planning process to see if one school might move to the next school. And so um, in a, one of the possible futures is that we have one school. And so I, I'm wondering, do you feel like that's a beneficial thing to set out a multi, have people go about the effort of doing a multi-year school plan when that school might not exist as a separate entity in, it, in the near term? Um, I do. I mean, so I would say for the three schools we have, um, the way we're approaching it is each of them have teams of staff, parent guardians um, who are going to participate, and two of them happen to be in the same building, right? Summit in the high school, and and I think in any scenario where there'd be any consolidation in the future, there'd still be some level of autonomy. You know, having visited schools, I mean, Frontier being an example, I spent a couple, quite a bit of time up there a couple of years ago, which is 7 through 12 school, there's a very defined middle school and a very defined high school. And yes, they share a building. And is there connections? Of course. And I'm not pro 7 through 12 or con, but I think I can't imagine a scenario where, like, the 7th and 8th graders don't have a unique identity in that. And I think it's also many, many... I don't. I don't think that's happening. I'm not suggesting that we would make a change that soon where it, it would influence. Could you could you tell the story though that you told it recently around co-located? <laughs> yes, I can. Please. So when I was it's in Germain, I promise. Yeah, yeah. I was in um, <laughs> I was in Virginia. So for people in the Amherst School Committee, they've heard um, at least the the front end of the story. So um, Ms. Richardson, who's the ELL coordinator, and I were in Virginia visiting uh, a district that has many dual language schools. And we walked into a middle school, and we spent an hour and a half there. We met with the principal. We met with the family outreach coordinator. We went in, got a tour of the whole school, went in multiple classrooms. And the next school was an elementary school. And it was, like, one was, like, 900 Main Street. One was, like, 916 Main Street. So I said, oh, can you walk there, or do we need to drive? And the person said, it's through the window. And the window is probably maybe two feet behind Kara. Um, and it was these co-located schools that, and I said, how does it work? They said, oh, it's fantastic. Like, you know, if a custodian's out, we can do coverage, sub coverage, but we're totally autonomous schools and, you know, the connections we have, they shared an auditorium, so there was a little coordination, but there was no blurring of which school was which school or that it was two distinct schools. Um, just Ms. Richards and I felt very silly because we'd spent an hour and a half and there was a window between them. It wasn't like as distinctly separated as one might imagine. But it shows you, it shows you that, that co-located separate schools can actually function as separate schools. Yes. Uh, my other short question was on uh, on that building master use plan process. Is, so is that, this is sort of related to Kara's question, is, this, is that specific just about 7th and 8th to the high school or, like, because when I think about building use, I, I think of our, our gold standard world class um, Art, performing arts faculty right. and how they don't have a gold standard performing arts space. Yes. Um, and like, gosh, every time I walk in there, I would love for that to happen someday over the rainbow. Right. And I'm wondering if this if this leads to the rainbow. It does not lead to that rainbow. <laughs> um, but but to be to answer your question more specifically, it's looking at a number of different configurations. Um, so one being, what would it mean for seventh and eighth grade to be at the high school? Would that fit? Would it be involve a building project? How comprehensive would that building project be? Right, those questions. It also is looking at sixth grade to the middle school, so maintaining two different schools, but you know, potentially expanding, you know, 
the enrollment of the middle school. Another scenario that has been raised to my attention by members of the public uh, as perhaps being the most cost effective, and again, I'm not advocating for any of these changes, just to, we need to study these things and answer, have answers to questions about cost and logistics and infrastructure, is what if eighth grade moved to the high school and sixth grade moved to the middle school? Right, so those are the kind of configuration kind of questions that we're uh, considering, um, we'll, 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 be, we'll, we'll be considering, but I also want to be clear that really what we're trying to answer is the financial infrastructure questions, facilities questions, when we get that information, we then have to make a choice to we engage the educational question. Because this is coming from a place, not because we think any of these configurations is better or worse than our current scenario. It's being driven by what we spent some time talking about before, was we have real fiscal pressure. And we have communities who are rightfully asking us, is there more a more fiscally efficient way that's educationally sound to where our students are educated? And I think my opinion is we need to answer that question clearly uh, about what the financial implications are, and then we need to large engage the larger community on, you know, does any of these things make sense, right? If there's really cost savings to be had, uh, and we know that, then we can start comparing options with that. Right. So I believe that at least at one. Okay. Um, so now we're at the downtown retail marijuana establishment. Um, as people may recall, and I think recall from a previous meeting, um, there is. Uh, I don't think I have this wrong, that the, the, the circles that existed in town that prescribed areas where retail marijuana establishments could legally go left a hole, a sm very small, <laughs> but a small hole in the downtown um, where there were then venues that could be potentially leased yeah. for it, marijuana It wasn't a hole until the Boys and Girls Club got their brand new their new home. Because when we met in, when we met in June That's right. the whole downtown area between the library, right. the Boys and Girls Club, the schools. No, and the right, of course that of it course that's all, logical. We were all good. No 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 of course that's logical. Of course that's logical. Could you so that, explain this? So there's a there's a buffer area around um there's some definition exclusion of exclusion zones. It's basically places where children congregate. Yeah, yeah. And but, but building Steve mentioned some Change right, but well, like the Boys and Girls Club, movement. they were down. They were downtown. Um, they were stuffed up. Like so there's no exclusion zone anymore. And R well, there. no, no. The point is, they just moved. They moved. They moved to an old dentist office down by the high school track field, from basically from behind Antonio's Pizza, uh, the second floor. I mean, it's not literally true, but it's figuratively true. And and if you look at where the buffer zones around those facilities were. It previously meant that there was no eligible location in the downtown for a facility to lease and open, and then now there is. Oh. And so the the question that we debated last spring has sort of risen again: is does the school committee have uh, a position that we wish to advance to uh, the town manager and the select board? Uh, relative to the approval and opening of marijuana establishments in the downtown, right? Is there so this is so this is on the agenda? Essential. Well, one by request, <laughs> but the other reason is uh, is because it's timely because there is in fact a proposal for um, for an establishment on Boltwood Place, um, close to where Bueno Asano is. Isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is the only reason we're commenting on this is to prevent the business from operating? Uh, it is on the agenda to discuss whether or not the committee would like to take a position. I suppose, I suppose conceptually, based on your comment, it is conceivable the committee could take a position in favor of opening the shop. Um, but I think the intention of bringing it on the agenda was the contrary position of seeing whether it would be interested in taking a position to not do so. I'm not, I'm just, I'm literally describing the item. I think there's someone else on the committee who might prefer to advance the argument, or not. I don't know. Can I, yes. just a clarifying question. So yeah. what, what are the options, though? Because uh, the zoning is the zoning. So when you say, if we want to take action, what, what would that action be? Uh, I don't actually know the efficacy of the action, so I'd be interested in hearing what the efficacy of the action would be. Please. Uh, um, yeah, so just to bring you up to speed on the process. So basically, the way that uh, a 
retail marijuana facility gets approved yeah. uh, in town is that there's they have to go through a certain number of steps. And one of the steps is having a community engagement meeting, public meeting. You meet with the retailers, they answer your questions. So that was a few weeks ago now, uh, maybe maybe four four or five weeks ago. Uh, I went to that. There was a few people there. I asked them some questions, um, and then at that point, uh, it goes to the town manager. Um, so that's where we are in the process. At some point, there isn't a specific date, but at some point, the town manager will either approve, um, based on his understanding of the zoning, what he feels is best for the town, um, and then if there's objection after that point, uh, it goes to the zoning board of appeals, which is a town board, which would then hear arguments and make a, a final decision. So we're at the point where the town manager has not yet made. A decision, um, you know, in terms of what we want to do, it's like Mr. Nakajima said; it's really up to the committee. Um, I, I asked for this for be on the agenda, and, and I appreciate the lateness of the hour, so I'll try to be as brief as I can, because um, I, I have some concerns with with this. Um, you know, like like we mentioned earlier, um, the, our understanding when last we left this was that downtown was completely covered by the buffer zones, and when the Boys and Girls Club, it left this very small spot, um, and. Uh, my concerns are basically about um, preparing our students in terms of education about what it's going to be like to be in a town with retail marijuana that's going to be a very popular location. One of the comments from the <coughs> retailers is that they expect hundreds of customers a day. They, they understand the, the draw from college. Um, and so it's education and, and access. Like, um, you know, I, I'm not naive to, to think that uh, there are no current high school students that use marijuana illegally. And I'm not naive to think that that access won't uh, increase whether the location is downtown or whether it's at the outskirts of town. Um, but my, my concern is with, is, is with the downtown. Um, so, so the proximity is, is the, my first concern in that we have, uh, I would say, a tradition, if not a regular occurrence, of our middle school and high school students um, going downtown. And it's, it's not the case in every town in Massachusetts where our middle school and high school are so close. Um, to downtown, and where it becomes a regular activity, um, uh, and, and, and we're one of the first adopters of uh, of of retail marijuana. And it, it's you know to be clear, this isn't about concern of kids getting into the store. There's there's the, the retailers went over badge swipe access, and I'm sure the door front security will be very good. We're, we're talking about you know the how people get access to illegal drugs today. It's it's the second hand resale market. It's College students walking out with products and you know selling those and so and I have a I have a hard time seeing how putting a retail marijuana shop in downtown wouldn't increase the access for our students than if the retail marijuana establishments were elsewhere in town um, and th and then we talk about the product because you know. I also want to be clear that this isn't like an anti-pot thing <laughs> uh, for me. Um, I, I do feel like alcohol is, is a much more harmful substance uh, for adults and will continue to be than, than marijuana is. Um, but, um, but when we, we talk about pot, especially our generations, which are older generations, I feel like we have to recalibrate our understanding a little bit. And um, the, the THC percentage in marijuana products has increased dramatically and has only increased much more so in the last 10 years when retail marijuana has come on. Um, and you know, it, it's a complex um, data uh, point to talk about in terms of what the exact percentage has been over time. Um, but, but the numbers people typically talk about is you know, the pot we grew up with in the 60s, 70s, 80s is anywhere from 2 to 4 5 percent THC maybe. And the pot that's available now, just the, the buds, the actual marijuana buds are 25 to 30 percent THC, and then there's other products, cookies, beverages, um, all, all sorts of chocolates and edibles that have an even higher percentage of THC. And so it's it's a different drug that we're talking about being introduced into the environment. Um, and, um, and another sort of exacerbating catalyst that I, I think about in terms of how it impacts our high school population is that we know that we have a jeweling problem at the high school. If you're not familiar with juuling, so it's e-cigarettes are basically a device where you can rapidly heat high-dose nicotine, uh, and you turns into a vapor that you inhale. It's vaping, and juuls are a form of e-cigarettes that look like a USB flash drive um, that are designed to be able to use in um, inconspicuous manner. And it's very easy for students to use a juul um, to vape high-dose nicotine in the middle of class and without teachers noticing or going into the bathroom. And it's, it's not just an ARHS issue, this is the, um, 
the FDC commissioner has called this an epidemic in high schools. This is a problem with high schools everywhere. And, and one of the products that, um, that the retailer sells, 3, 365 recreational marijuana, um, are these concentrates that you can then put into these jeweling devices. And these concentrates are anywhere from 80 to 96% THC. So, you know, so compare that to what me in our experience or what we did or did not inhale in our youth of the 2 to 4%, and it becomes a different thing. Um, so, you know, at the, at the end of the day, again, I don't want to be naive to, to, to think that kids aren't going to get access to what they're going to get access to, but I feel like um, right now it's, it's all speculation about what retail pot is going to look like in our town. And wouldn't it be good to have the benefit of experience, to have those lessons learned that we're going to have a year from now, a year from the first day that retail pot opens, to say this is what we would have taught our kids in middle school and in high school. This is what the program would have looked like. This is what law enforcement would have done differently in order to minimize um, sale in the retail market. Um, so again, I don't want to be anti-pot, but I do have concerns. And you know, my, my desire would be for the town to pause on this central location um, and, until we have more experience with it in our town. I'm just reluctant to place additional restrictions on a legitimate business beyond the current law. I, I just have a problem with that. You, you're saying that if a business operates totally legally, they should be excluded from going in business? It's not going to because of secondhand problems. I'm not going to debate that back and forth. I mean, I, 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 you're not literally asking him that question. I assume. Oh, I'm asking what is, what is your position on vaping? Should we come up with a position against vaping too? Okay, I guess that is a question. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying. You know what I mean? Like we don't yeah. normally do cross debate yeah. on stuff. But. Oh, I'm sorry. But, I, so, I didn't. No, I, I am glad that you brought the question up because. Um, what, a problem, I think, with illegal marijuana, marijuana having been illegal, is that it's been stigmatized. And it's been, frankly, it's also been used by law enforcement and continues to be used by law enforcement, and particularly at the national and state levels, for incarcerating and uh, people of color. And uh, it's, it's been used as a precursor for, for other sentences and, and guidelines. So it's, I, I, recreational marijuana is legal in Massachusetts now. And it's, it's the law of the land, and I, I support it in town. I think what we have to do and this is why it's a zoning question, and this is why I would like um, to us to think about whether we express our concerns about a zoning decision, is, is where ought this to be in our town the very first year when we have no data on how this is gonna look, right? And so, like, there are, there are half a dozen other um, retail shops already proposed. There's gonna be lots of retail marijuana in Amherst, lots of places to get it. So access for adults is not gonna be an issue. It's, it's do we wanna put it right in between Antonio's and Bueno, where we know our kids go, uh, we know our kids go independently, we know we're happy our kids go independently, um, and is that something that's th that we that we want to do right now? That's that's really my, my question. Okay, Mr. Um, I guess I, I'm disappointed that this new opening has arisen because of the movement of the Boys and Girls Club. I think I share some reluctance about taking a stance against it, but I wonder if there could be a way of taking a stance for um, more proactively engaging with the organization to, to, to make a plan around the potential for younger people to be around the establishment. I guess I'm just thinking like there's on, there's on the main street, there's a liquor store. You know, and, and I, I, I don't think they're that different. You know, you're supposed to be in either location. Um, I'm also really hopeful that this will potentially be a source of revenue for our town and in turn for our schools. And if potentially, I, I mean, that's the silver lining I'm trying to see for all of these new establishments um, arising. And so maybe to try to work with, with them, maybe rather than against them or find a, if, especially if we can't get agreement on the committee to um, take a stance against the establishment being located in that spot, then maybe we could just try to be proactive and thinking through and making sure they're thinking about this issue. I, I, having grown up in this town, I know that marijuana has been readily available throughout the entire time I've lived here. I, this may increase it a little bit, but I'm not sure it's actually gonna be such a substantial increase. I, we're gonna see it um, having a really big change. I mean, marijuana is readily available prior to any of this 
um, change in law for our high schoolers and middle schoolers, unfortunately. So what I'd like to do is move through the committee for any other additional comments, and then obviously the superintendent has that, if he has any comment, and then stop, basically, only because it's a discussion <laughs> and it's it's 10.05. Um, so I, get, I can run through the committee. I guess I'll start with you since you you spoke a lot already. Not um, that it's a bad thing. Yeah, I'm just yeah. No, so uh, I, I also hope for the, for the retail um, <laughs> revenue. Uh, I think it's a little overstated in, in rose-colored glasses in terms of the impact it's going to have on our our financial situation. Um, I, I do think it is um, different. My concern is different than alcohol, and the even though I do think ultimately alcohol is more harmful to to, to youth, is is that because of the um, concealability and and the high potency, it's it's gonna, it's going to be really easy for a student to bring in high concentrate THC into the high school and to use it, um, and as well as cookies and beverages and and that that kind of stuff is is not available. Um, in, in, in Amherst today, and I think um, I think there will be lessons learned about what we would like to empower our students with, um, our youngest students in, in middle school and high school, about what to expect and the decisions that they should make. Um, and I think there are lessons learned about um, how law enforcement uh, is going to want to manage outside um, in in the in the greater zone. It's it's not just about right outside the doorway. You know, it's about the stream of of students leaving and partying downtown and, and where do you pick that up and do you want that concentrated on University Drive? Do you want it concentrated on downtown? And um, I, I just, I don't see a lot of downside in, in asking for a pause. I'm, I'm not even saying, you know, don't have a retail pot shop in downtown. I'm saying, let's, let's just pause. Let's, let's have some experience with it in town so that we can make a more informed decision about our education and our, our regulation approach. Um, normally I don't like going second, but I guess I have to. Uh, I, I'm, I'm with Ms. Spitzer on this, really. I think um, uh, earlier when I asked the question on well, the wellness goal, uh, I don't know Dr. Morris knows this, I keep every opportunity I get semi-regularly, I hammer the nail on what are we doing to plan as a district um, to more holistically engage around issues of wellness, but in particular with the legalization of marijuana um, how do we how do we engage in a really affirmative and positive way? And I think, but but to me, and I said the same thing, not to be a stuck record, but I said the same thing last spring, that I actually view issues of wellness to be arrayed along sort of a spectrum of issues and behaviors that people can get into. And the question of how one is supported, taught, as well as counseled and supported and engaged with to get on a track in which they're dealing with either behaviors colleagues or substances in an affirmative way um, is, uh, is, cha is, is challenging, but I think that it's, it's really necessary to do. And I think it's necessary anyway. I mean, Mr. Demling's brought up the question, as you did earlier, about our, our interaction with electronic devices, including uh, obviously particularly kids and how it affects them neurologically and otherwise. That's really true. And, and, and so to me, I would love to see the school committee be proactive and the schools be proactive on engaging um, in being a real leader in the state around wellness because I think the issues that are raised around vaping and juuling and how that could how that is already currently an issue and I know there's been a programming in the schools around it but also that it's going to be compounded by the availability of, of um, and it's, it's challenging right because if it's if it's legal and it's sold legally, but also the message is, oh, we have certification labs now, so this is a safe liquid um, cannabis, cab cab cabinoid or whatever it is, um, that, that sends a bad message to someone, <laughs> uh, youth or otherwise, that, that this, this is somehow a certified safe uh, liquid. And, uh, and so engaging really proactively and really creatively is I think really important, and it's important on the town side too. Um, I mean, I, the, I guess this is where I'd have a um, somewhat mild disagreement that I think that um, I think the any increased ready availability of legal uh, marijuana products, including in the downtown, is already going to be accelerated regardless of whether there's a shop in the downtown. I think it's a, I don't I don't think the presence of the the presence of the shop may 
create more of a visual appeal around the idea of it's legal and it's there and it puts front in mind, like any advertising does. I think in terms of accessibility, including accessibility, you know, in the alleyways downtown, I think that's going to increase anyway, and it's going to be present anyway. And so the question of how the town is going to engage in that, either as a public health or, or a law enforcement action, and how we do that with the shops that open up and others, becomes a really critical question. It's important that it to be done well and done right. And my, my point on that is that it's a different approach, obviously a different approach, to getting at actually the same point, which is this needs to be taken seriously, it needs to be taken creatively and proactively. And one of one, two years ago, one of my biggest disappointments sitting around with people who are involved in public health around town was there was there were a number of people I know who looking ahead at the ballot initiative had their head in the sand, like I don't want to deal with this <laughs> until it passes because I'm kind of hoping it'll just go away. And my message at the time being was, oh my God, you've got to know your town. This is going to pass overwhelmingly, and according to the polling, it's going to pass everywhere else in the state, which means don't stick your head in the sand. Think creatively now about what needs to be done to have a healthy, supportive, but also legally enforceable environment. I'll stop there. I'm sorry. I'm going to pass. This side of the table has said what I would say. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm sort of in a, in a middle ground because um, I, I, I share the sentiment that we have, we have zoning laws, it's, it's legal, and I don't, wanna, I don't sort of want to be in a position of asking our town leaders to be making a decision that's sort of contrary to what might be um, already, you know, zoned and sort of perfectly okay. So puts them in an awkward position, and so we we'd sort of be out on a limb asking them to do something that might not be sort of perceived as, you know, enforcing the the laws. That said, I do think I go back, and that's why I asked the question about sort of what action could we be asking them to do, mm -hmm. and I think you know the 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 zoning when it passed because I was on you know, sat in the town meeting when it was when it came up and I think the zoning the maps at that time showed that there was not going to be anything in downtown and I think that part is critical and I think that probably weighed in on as as people were evaluating as the town meeting was evaluating whether this zoning what made sense and so looking at that whole downtown and there was you know there's not any spots where this could happen and now it's sort of the shells have moved and now there is a, 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 a little hole and so I'm not sure if the intent had been to you know in, in, in thinking of those zonings I don't know but I think that that going and, and sort of talking about the pause in terms of looking at the zoning might be something to, to talk about versus going after one business person who wants to open up a shop that is right now perfectly okay and within bounds. So I, I know that's sort of a wishy-washy statement, but I, I do sort of think that there was a perception that in passing the zoning and looking at the zoning that we were saying we didn't want retail establishments in downtown. And so I would say that could be the, the angle that I would be comfortable sort of signing on to. We're done. We're done. If there's a, did you make it? I don't really I, have anything there. to add. I think it's, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. It's if everyone said it better than say I said at this point. Grunted and groaned. No. no. <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, it's a tough question. Okay. You have anything? Uh, at this you don't hour. Have to. I'm just no, asking. no. I'll I'll be very brief. Um, so I think to the chair's point. Our focus at the school level has been about um, the wellness piece, right? So it's wherever the shops are, and I'm not trying to minimize, I think Mr. Demling raised some good points. That, you know, I would say this community access is, is more readil readily um, fulfilled than in some other communities, um, but we expect that to continue. Um, and what's unclear to us is, is the specter of marijuana being something that's illegal, even though it still be illegal for students um, in our high school, how does that affect the public perception of, um, of students, of, of children, about the use of marijuana? There's plenty of other things that one can't do until they're a certain age. But we're going from something that you know, legally one couldn't do at all, 
or the exception of some medical marijuana or, you know, some not recreational marijuana, mm -hmm. I'll just put it that way, to something that's now been legalized and, and kind of from official bodies of government saying, yes, this is something people can do. It's, it's, um, and so one of the things that we are actively in conversations about is how do we work with children about that change? How do we, and, and I'm not just talking necessarily about high school students, that is most of our conversation, or even middle school students. I know it's a regional meeting, but I think it's worth saying that we're thinking about at the, at the elementary mm -hmm. level. What does that look like? How, how do kids, per, how does it change their perception um, of marijuana as being, you know, a substance that some adults may legally use, but is illegal for kids? And how do we get pro-social thinking about that uh, when students are younger than we typically have talked about it? Because I think the change will get, it will, students will see marijuana stores, whether it's on University Drive or um, in other communities, and I don't know about Leverage Shoots or in Pelham at this point, but that's a really different mental schema, particularly for young children. And so we are actively talking about this K-12, to um, and that's where our focus will remain being. Okay. okay. Well, I think I, I heard a um, mixed story from the committee, a couple of references that could potentially be supportive of, of, a, of a motion or action of the committee and numbers that were not. Um, Yes. Where, where are we going with this? When would we have to make a decision on what are, are we moving? Do you know what I mean? Like well, how I think, the, I, think the, I mean, obviously one of the questions that only we know is whether November 20th would be too late, um, whether it's likely the town manager make a decision before then. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, that's when it would have to come up for consideration unless there was a request for a special session of the, of the regional school committee to meet. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I, if I, I guess my, I guess I'm not. It, if the committee wants a motion put forward, then we can request a drafting of a motion to put forward. I'm actually not hearing that from the committee. Um, so, I me, mean, I'm not hearing a majority of the committee saying that. And so, if a, if a member of the committee or members of the committee we're interested in putting forward a motion, they could do so and we could be, you know, we put it on the agenda next meeting. It would be published in advance of that meeting and we'd have a discussion at that time and then take a vote. As we would have anything else. And that's how we do it. And with that I'm moving on. Um, upcoming school committee planning, upcoming topics. We're really gonna talk about something as far away as November twentieth. Yes we need to. Yeah. Uh, so the topics I have, uh, I think we, we've invited, and I think they will be able to do it, our MSAN students, Marty Sword Achievement Network students um, who are taking the course. They're traveling Boston, so no flights this year, which is great, easy, uh, to a conference. Their conference is not this week, but it's the end of next week, I believe. Uh, it might be the week after. I, yeah, I think it's the end of next week, excuse me. Um, to invite them, historically, like going way back, students usually came and talked about what they learned at their conference and their action plan. We'd like to get back to them coming to school committee to share that. It's always, you know, meaningful experience to interact with students and talk about what they're working on. Um, we have budget guidance, uh, which is different than what we talked about tonight, but yes. um, budget guidance. Uh, I think we, I would like to come back to regional assessment, um, the conversation we had, and get to perhaps some next steps more clearly. Um, Final superintendent goals vote? Superintendent goals vote I've got. HR office update, diversity hiring, professional development. Uh, math curriculum update um, was another one. <coughs> and uh, something that may want to talk about, given a prior conversation literally this evening with Amherst Media, is location of meetings. So that's a little... In our meetings? Yes. So I don't want to... Are these ever going to get fixed? They're not going to get fixed or something? So I don't want to, it's not on the agenda, <laughs> so I'm trying to be cautious about not leading. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Forget, no, no, no. For, for strike that. Yeah. Strike my question. Uh, Mr. Menino, then Mr. Dunley. A constituent of mine have asked me to raise a topic of homework. Could uh, there be a study similar to the elementary school uh, homework policy for middle school and high school? Could that be a possibility? Okay. Mr. Dunley? Uh, sounding like a pack agenda, but the uh, charter letter will have to be on that. For the, given the Absolutely. Uh, and I will try to get a, a draft well in advance of that. 
so that because it will be yeah 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 since yeah, yeah. it'll be the first time we'll be seeing the draft yeah yeah no that's great anything else Spencer well I I don't know if we should add it to this I probably won't be here I'm due the sixteenth so <laughs> <laughs> um, if I am here I'll be who knows um but I'm hearing that the marijuana conversation is one that even if we're not going to be passing some sort of resolute mm -hmm. or sorry motion mm -hmm. is one that given what I just suggested that we were pro proactive about it I'm wondering if maybe in the upcoming weeks or months we should put something on there and if we should consider inviting I, I, I mean Jeff Kravitz has been the most kind of from the economic development I'm not mm -hmm. sure he's like oh, who would we want to engage with would it, there be people from public health or I, I just thinking about how mm -hmm. to start thinking about a planning for this this change and maybe it doesn't need to be on the agenda yeah, soon, may not, well it may not have to be some, the November 20th but it could down, be maybe the one in December road. or one after that yeah no I think that's all I think that's awesome because I mean I've, I've um, setting aside the issue of doing a motion or resolution or anything else um, you know this I've been radiating nervousness <laughs> yes that our committee is not taking enough proactive measures no, forget the committee we can vote anything we want, right? In a certain sense, who cares? I'm worried that our school district isn't taking enough proactive steps. And also that when we get into budgeting, like before we have a new town council, I, I want us to already be down the road on a plan of saying what we would do with resources from the town in the upcoming budget. To I mean, my, Sorry to go off on this, but I'm just, like, I genuinely want us to view ourselves as what would it mean for us to be a best-in-class Maybe even national lead leading. And it's not the issue of being nationally leading itself. What I'm saying is, I mean, wait, you have Washington, you have Colorado, you have California. There aren't a lot of places doing this. Right. I doubt the state of practice is that advanced in trying to figure out what do we do to advance a safety and wellness conversation with kids around legal, legal recreational marijuana, but within the spectrum and context of other, other drugs or behaviors, right? How do we do that right? And how do we get that right? Mm -hmm. And what more could we be doing? We should be really working on that, and I feel like, and I'm not, I'm, I'm sure maybe you yeah, are, right. but I feel like, I don't see it, I don't feel like we are. Right. So I'd love to put that on the agenda. Not that I wouldn't have if you just asked anyways, but <laughs> I don't express my enthusiasm for <laughs> putting on the agenda. You weren't that enthusiastic about studying homework. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, no one likes talking about homework. It's just, it's painful, it's the late hour. Uh, no, no, that's great. I'm so, I'm, you know, I'm just joking with you. That's a wonderful topic. Uh, good? Got it? Yep, I do. Is there a move to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Is there a second? I second. All those in favor? Adjourn. Thank you, Amherst Media. Please,